Good morning, everyone. Today is 5 December, the year 2006. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve the history of our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in those conflicts. Today I'm here at the museum, and I have the honor and the privilege of interviewing Sergeant Ralph Watt. Sergeant Watt was a platoon sergeant in Europe during World War II, earning five battle stars. So we're going to talk to him about that and a lot of other things. Nice to have you here, Ralph. Thank you. Now, uh, first of all, would you state and uh, spell your full name for us, please? My name is Ralph Lowell Watt, R-A-L-P-H-L-O-W-E-L-L, -L -L, Watt, W-A-T-T. -T. And when and where were you born? I was born July the 22nd, 1922, in a small little town on the south shore of Lake Superior called Port Wing, Wisconsin. And how do you spell uh, that? Port, P-O-R-T, Wing, W-I-N-T. Oh, Port Wing, Port, okay. Port, Port, Port Wing. Wing, I say it just like it sounds. Um, and um, we're, um, we're in relation to large cities, for instance, would that be? It's about uh, 45 miles to the east of Duluth and Superior. Gets a little cold there, I imagine. A little in the wintertime. <laughs> Very nice in the summertime. Uh -huh. And what was the population when you lived there? And what, My what little town was a hamlet of about probably 300 people. Uh, my grandfather and grandmother, immigrants from Sweden, had homesteaded in the area just outside of town, a quarter section of pristine timberland. Oh, okay. And uh, my mother, who was their daughter, and my father, who had come from Illinois, married and I was born. Uh, my father, by the way, had been a pilot during World War I. Well, tell me about that. What, what, what was your father's name? His name was Waldo Watt, W-A-T-T. -T. Ralph Waldo Watt, actually. Ra oh, well, after what, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Yeah, that's not, exact, not, no, exactly not, right. My grandmother <laughs> named him. She was a favorite reader of Ralph Waldo Emerson, so oh, she okay. named her son Ralph Waldo Watt. I was going to say, not Waldo Pepper, though. No, he went to uh, uh, into the service. He volunteered, enlist, enlisted, and uh, he wanted to go into the Air Corps. It was called the Army Air Corps. Was this prior to World War One? This was during World during, War One, okay. toward the end of World War One, and uh, he was assigned to Lone Oak Field in Arkansas with the rank of chauffeur. He was a pilot trainee, Curtis Wright Trainers. Uh, he next rank up uh, after he'd been in for, for a while, become proficient in flying and handling a plane and repairing it. He did a lot of their own repairs, as you know. He reached the rank of sergeant, so he was a flying sergeant. But the, overall, the program was called the Flying Cadets uh -huh. of the United States Army, and it was the Air Corps. In those days, not the Air Force. Right. As a matter of fact, when I went into service, it was still the Air Corps, and it wasn't changed until later to the Air Force. Do you have any photographs of him with his planes or in his uniform? Yes, I do. I have a number of photographs and some of the wrecks that they had. That uh, love to uh, see those and add them to your uh, to I, your I have a biography whole, too. I, yeah, I have a whole photo. Uh, all that would of, be uh, great. That kind of stuff. We'll have to show you, uh, Bob was just ec ecstatic the other day when I came in. Someone had come in and they had a, a, so a long photograph of the guys who chased Pancho Villa, the pilots. Uh, I think it was taken at North Island, it was where they had done like their training. And, and he could identify several of the early pilots uh, you know, in the service back prior to World War I, actually. Well, from Low and Old Field, he went to... Uh El Paso, Texas. I've forgotten the name of the field that he was at down there, but he did advanced training down there. And then uh, before the war ended, he ended up being transferred to March Air Force Base. Oh, really? So he was stationed out here. Why didn't you know that that was there? And then? he always kind of had in the back of his mind that I should be a flyer. He loved to fly. But in northern Wisconsin, when he was discharged, there was no opportunity. Mm -hmm. And his family was more important to him. So uh, that's the reason I tried to enlist in the Air Force and uh, 
or the Air Corps at the time, the Navy and all those right. places, so and you, couldn't get in. I, for the first time, I discovered I was, as a 20-year-old, I was colorblind. And my mother was colorblind, and we never knew that. Oh. Of course, that's where I, what I inherited. So, yeah. By colorblind, like if you looked at that flag behind you, would it look like it looks to me, or would it look different to you? It looks like it would look to you, except that probably I don't recognize the intensity of the hues like you might. I was taught colors, just as you were taught colors. Uh, I always kid people and say, you know, the stop go lights, I, I know the red light's on top. When that, lead, that top light comes on, it's red. Although sometimes it's not very visible to me. I can just tell that it's on. Uh, if I play golf with a red tee, I can't find it in the green grass. It's impossible. <laughs> That's amazing. So I couldn't, they wouldn't take me. Yeah. But the interesting thing was after the war, I began working on a pleasure boat for trolling purposes on Lake Superior while I was waiting in school. In fact, I was going to school in the wintertime doing this in the summertime. Um, I had to have a pilot's license. And I had to know red green lights. And you know, I worked on that, and I worked on that, and I finally uh, learned that I could tell the difference between red and green out in the water. Uh, so that when I went to take my test, I was able to pass it. I had a pilot's license to handle boats with passengers up to 65 length, feet in length. <laughs> yeah, and um, now your father's ancestors, where did they all come from? My family came from England, northern England, initially on my father's side. And uh, they moved uh, from, they landed in Baltimore. From Baltimore they moved to Ohio. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, my gr great-grandfather's brother was became famous for a, a, a pottery that he developed called the Watt Pottery in, in Ohio. Mm. And it is today, Watt Pottery is quite expensive. Hard to find, but uh, if you can, they're, they're worth something. Uh, then they moved on to Illinois, where my, my mother, grandfather's family began farming in Illinois. They had a large farm. They were apparently reasonably well off. But my grandfather, his name was Charles Fremont Watt, was a wanderer. And his wife, a marvelous lady, Sally Dills, she uh, couldn't hold him down, and he had to go. He did go to school, and he became a dentist at Wake Forest University. He didn't like practicing dentistry, so he went to school and back to school at Illinois Normal Teachers College and got a, a degree in teaching. So for years he taught, and he has high recommendations. I have all of those in the family record. But he didn't like it. He wanted to go back to his farming. And he wasn't satisfied with Illinois, so he took his young family and he went to Canada. Didn't like it in Canada, so the next thing you know, he's down in Wisconsin, where he did settle in and stayed for the rest of his life. He died there. He lived in our house for a while with my parents. Uh, an eccentric man who was brilliant. He, he was well read, and he had the most gorgeous Spencerian hand in writing you've ever seen. But that's the way they were taught in those days. How, how, uh, at what age did he pass away? Uh, he died in 1932. Uh, he was about uh, 68 or 69. Your mother, uh, what was her maiden name? My mother was a Larson, L-A-R-S-O-N. Her family came from Sweden, and she was born here. But their father's name was Lars Magnuson. Now, to make you under, help you understand this, in the Swedish, uh, when the immigrants came from Sweden, many of them changed their name to Americanize it. And the way to do that was to, her father, who was Fred Magnuson, took the name of her dad's first name, Lars, added S-O-N to it, and became Fred Larsson. Lars son, you understand mm -hmm. that? Yeah. L A R S S O N. Oh. And so when he came here, that's and then it wasn't too long before he dropped the S as they did, and became L A R S O N. Yeah. And uh, he was land hungry. He had lived on farms in in Sweden, growing up that were 
sort of tenant farms. They're owned by what they call factories. Factories were big companies that came in and, and took the harvest from these farmers and processed it and so forth and so on. And the man who did the farming, he received some of those that goods as payment, but he also lived on the farm and tilled the land. And he didn't like that. So he was anxious to get out of Sweden and come to this country, which he did. Uh, uh, I've forgotten now, it was about uh, 1875, 77, something like that. And uh, he wanted land. He met a young woman who was singing in the church choir, and he was in the ch church choir. Of course, it was a Lutheran church, I didn't know if they came from Sweden. And they married. She was very young. He was 32 years old, and she was 18. But one of the most wonderful people in the world, she was. Uh, she, uh, he built a beautiful home. He had a technique, a talent as a, as, a, as a carpenter. He worked on the railroad. Then he worked for the granaries, the grain elevators in, in Duluth. And uh, he built a nice two-story house on Piedmont, Piedmont Avenue in Duluth. And she was thrilled with her home. Began to have a family. And, uh, the, uh, in fact, she had an older son, Fred, and then they had two children, Hedvig and Herbert, who were twins. One day, Grandpa came home and said, uh, we're, I'm going exploring. What are you doing? He said, I want to go look for some land. So they tra he traveled with some friends of his, two other men, to down along the shoreline of Lake Superior, about 50 miles down from Superior to Lake. and. Uh, he found the land that he wanted near a small river called the Flag River. That's where I was born. Uh, he homesteaded a quarter section, which they were allowed to do. And by the way, the Homestead Act had just gotten going up in northern Wisconsin. And the loggers had already gotten in there, and the, and the government didn't want to homestead the land out to logging companies, because all they did was clear the land and then left it. So uh, they were thrilled to have men come in with families, and so my father grandfather and his wife and three small children were the first residents, actually permanent residents, that lived year-round in the little town of Portland, Wisconsin. <laughs> the name came from a man whose name was Colonel Wing, oh. and uh, he was a sort of a benefactor to the community. When they built a church, a Lutheran church, Colonel Wing provided the bell for the tower still flying and still still ringing today, that bell. Uh, so they honored him by naming the community Port Wing. Mm -hmm. And so that's a little bit of history of the town. My, the home that I was born in is still standing. It's still a good-looking home. Uh, my Street. folks were renting it at the time. But uh, it's an old house now. But How long did you live in that house? Oh, I didn't live there very long. Uh, after my birth and my, my brother's birth, uh, I guess we lived there about three and a half years or something like that. Then my dad got a job in Ashland, Wisconsin, and he worked for what is called the Minnesota Tea Company, where you were on the road and took tea out to around to all, and other sundries out to around to all these stores. And he did pretty well at it. Uh, but he wasn't happy with that. So he kept looking for land too, and finally he did, learned that the old Dr. Iverson's place in Port Wing, Wisconsin was for sale. And so back to Port Wing we go, and we bought that little piece of land. It wasn't large, it was about 65 acres, uh, but we farmed it. We farmed it with uh, cows, milk cows. My mother raised on a farm. She was a, as good a milker as you could find any place. Everything was done by hand. And we raised a lot of turkeys, we raised a lot of geese, we raised lots of chickens. We sold the eggs, we sold turkeys live, we sold geese live. We didn't do any butchering or anything of that nature. My dad would have turkey shoots every year and make lots of money off of that, even in the Depression years. Now, turkey suit shoots in those days, did they shoot actual They didn't shoot turkeys? the turkeys, turkeys. turkeys they had targets. That's right, yeah, that was and what then, I used and to then they, they got a live turkey, because we didn't yeah. do any of the, 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 the killing. We no. could have, but that's too much, you know, yeah. so we weren't in that kind of business. But the yeah. people would, the, the legs would be tied on the turkey, and <laughs> they'd stuff them in a gunny sack and carry them home, you know. Yeah. For the, so it worked out quite well, and he was kind of uh, enterprising in these mm -hmm. things that we did. 
Uh, I built cows from the big time I was big enough to hold a pail between my legs, and I didn't like it. Twice a day, I had my two cows as, as a kid. My mother milked probably three or four, and my dad, who had to go out and go to work during the Depression, when he found work, uh, was not available, not around. So uh, I had an uncle who lived with us, my mother's brother, and he would help with three or four cows. So we were milking about 10 cows a day, and uh, I grew to hate it. <laughs> and I said, if I ever can get off of this farm, I'm gone. But interestingly enough, I love the farms. I still... Is that farm still there? That farm is owned by my cousin. Oh, okay. And the house is still there? The house is gone. It was oh, torn oh, down. Oh, the oh. houses that, uh, then were built on cedar foundations, cedar posts. And they would hold up as long as they could, 40, 50 years, and then the mm -hmm. posts would rot out. Yeah. So when the posts went, uh, Keith, my cousin, had the house torn down. His mother and father bought it from my mother and father. Did you have brothers and sisters? I have a brother, Brother Ray, mm -hmm. who's currently living in Orlando, Florida. Okay. And I have a sister who's living in a little town right near the Wisconsin border uh, in Illinois. Mm -hmm. And what, what's, her, what's her name? Her name is Charlotte, Charlotte. Leafblad. Uh -huh. um, so, I, I mean, I know the, living on the farm, it kept you pretty busy with your chores and things, but what, gro growing up, what did you do for fun? What did you guys uh, like to do? Uh, we, I had a dog that my dad trained. It was a big collie mixture. He weighed about 90 pounds, a powerful dog, called Pal. My dad trained him to go get the cows. The cows were out in the pasture every day, up in the woods. And all we need to do is send Pal after him. He never tore a tail. He never nipped and bit their heels, but he drove them home. Anyway, he was an outstanding dog. And the other thing my dad did was to train the dog to pull a sled in a wagon. And so I used him in sleigh red ra races in the fall and the winter time. But I also used him to deliver milk because we delivered raw milk to a lot of people in town. And we had crates, and we'd have these glass bottles with with wax tops on the top, caps. And, and uh, uh, Pal, all I needed, he knew the route right to a tee. All I needed was hike him. Hike, go, and away he went. He'd go to the first house. I'd break with my feet. We'd, I'd run in with the milk, come back out, and away we'd go. We had to do it fast, because if the weather was cold, I'd end up with milk standing up an inch high out of the bo bottle with the cap sitting on top. So. We had to move. Yeah, I lived on a small farm. Our next door neighbors, they would bring milk over to us. It'd be in those bottles, and like I said, it'd be up. Yeah. And it was not homogenized. I mean, you'd have no, no, the no. butter it fat on the milk. top. It was raw milk. Yeah. Although we separated some of the milk with cream separators, and I had to crank the, cr the, the cream separator because cream was worth more money. Mm -hmm. We sold it to the creamery where they made butter from it. Although we made butter at home sometimes, too. Yeah. Did you have lakes or ponds on your farm? We had a river. River, not a river, a, a good sized stream, water running year round from a natural spring up on our property. Hmm. And it was very interesting there, and so the cattle always had uh, water. We had horses on the farm too because we had to do farm work. We had to hay, hmm. we had to cultivate, we had to skid logs in the wintertime. So I grew up with horses, and I had a riding horse, or I used one of the horses for as a riding horse. And he was great. He was also used as a buggy horse. His name was Peter. And he was a pacer that my father had bought after the war. Uh, and if you know what a pacer is, both left feet go forward at the same time and the right feet go forward. Not like a trot trotter, which is cross. Mm -hmm. And long strides. And when you we'd have him on the buggy, I'm not kidding you, his strides were seven and eight feet. Big, long strides. And he'd travel he could travel for hours at six, seven miles an hour. Hmm. Now, how far from the lake, Lake Superior, were you then? We were about, uh, I'd say, almost a half a mile. Oh, oh, you're we, that close. We were above the uh, high up, and we look out over the Lake Superior. Oh, you could we see had it. A perfect oh, view wow. of Lake Superior. Did you go swimming there in the summertime? Cold, so? yes, we did swim it a lot. Did, yeah, did but you? We go? had other places to swim on our river. Uh, but just below our farm, on the Braff farm, was a waterfalls from our creek. Mm -hmm. And uh, it made a big pool at the bottom. It became the community swimming place. Wow. And the water was a little bit warmer there than it was in Lake Superior.
Did you do much fishing? Lots of fishing. Grew up with fish. Northern pike, walleyes, and copies, and bluegills, and so forth. Caught, I've caught 10,000 of them, maybe. <laughs> um, also did skiing. Did a lot of skiing. Is it? A lot of tobogganing. Um, downhill or cross-country skiing? Uh, both. Oh, both. are there mountains both. around? Hills. Oh, hills. Not mountains, but they're hills. You could, you could, yeah. We even had ski jumps that we, we really? worked on as kids, yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you have a smokehouse on the farm? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, we had uh, root cellars, we had smoke houses, and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Chickens uh, were a big item for us. Uh, you didn't make much on chicken eggs, but I'll tell you that money coming in was important to us because we were we were cash poor all the time during the Depression. I uh, meant to ask you how that impacted your family. You said your dad had to go to get He went and found jobs. jobs. He was a pretty good mechanic because uh -huh. he learned in the Air Force. Uh, they did a lot of work on their own engines. And so when he came home, uh, he had that talent, and so he went to work for McCormick during Tractor Company, which is about 50 miles away in Superior. And uh, he drove in there, come home on weekends, but we ran the farm. Of course, I was a big kid, so uh, the uh, I could do most of the men's work, you know. And. There were exciting times on the farm. I'll tell you, we had sleigh rides and we had hay rides and we had active church groups that we were in part of. And mm -hmm. our old school is uh, was recently taken down. Oh. I have a picture of that old school. It was fantastic, built in 1903, a three-story shiplap building <laughs> yeah. on on con on, on uh, sandstone foundation because on the lake they had a little sandstone quarry down there. Which built, which was shipped all over to Chicago, Duluth, and so forth. A lot of buildings were built out of sandstone, which is not the best building stone mm -hmm. because it does erode away eventually. But the, um, uh, what was the name of the school? Was that that grade school? It was Port Wing School. <laughs> did, did it have it high start, school? It started with grade one and it went through grade 12. Oh, okay. <laughs> my mother was there. Uh, all of my aunts and uncles went to school there. However, only two of them graduated from the high school because my grandfather didn't see the sense in schooling. He let them go until they finished the eighth grade and then he'd order them home and go to work. A lot of the girls he didn't even let to finish the eighth grade. Now there were 12 kids in that family. There were actually 13 had been born but one died. There were 12 kids. All lived to be, all but one lived to be over 80 years of age. Mm -hmm. And from the terrible primitive conditions that they had with no MD, no doctors available. And in that first winter that they were there, there were no uh, uh, neighbors even. She had some help from some Chippewa Indians that they, my grandfather allowed to stay on the farm up by the spring uh, because he thought he could use them. And uh, he did use them. He did use them to cut some timber. And the timber was important because he could sell that and get money, see? Mm -hmm. That's how he, and he was smart in that regard. He, he would, uh, they'd pile the, the, the timber, the logs by the, by the creek and uh, go upstream and dam up the creek. And uh, when you wanted to float the logs down, you open the dam up and the logs were all piled right there at the creek side mm -hmm. and the water picked them up and took them all down to the mill pond <laughs> where the lumber mill was. Oh, okay. So they were transported that way. Oh, some of them were from back up in the back country. I remember sleighs, bobs that they would pile logs on 15 feet high. I got pictures of this. It's, it's amazing how they chained those things down and had to come downhill with some of them. And uh, I, I look at teams of horses trying to break themselves. My father, my grandfather's oldest son, Fred, was a teamster. And he often told me about uh, these things. Uh, once in a while, horses would uh, slip and slide or fall down. They'd get up, and the thing would gain momentum. And he said, so the only thing you do is try to outrun the sled. In other words, get to kick the horses in gear and let them go. Yeah. And uh, yeah. hopefully they didn't fall and get run over or have a catastrophe. But he never had a bad accident, although there were some that had accidents. The, the Chippewas, did they have a reservation or did they? had a reservation over uh, near Bayfield, which was about 30 miles, 35 oh. miles to the east of Port Wing. 
but they wandered all around Lake Superior. Fishing was their thing. They had basket uh, uh, traps all set off for fish, and mm -hmm. some of them okay, were over around Port Wing area, and so they lived in that area. Any of them go to go to school? With no, you? they did not go to school then. But I went to, and I went to Bayfield. There were a lot of Indians going to school. In fact, I played basketball with a number of them. Uh, it's uh, the original tribe were called Chippewas, but there were a lot of they broke down into Ojibwe Indians and um, a number of other branches. Mm -hmm. Some of my good friends were Indians. Yeah, yeah. school. Did you uh, did you finish high school at Port Wing? Or? I finished high school at Bayfield. Oh, Bay, okay. My dad was transferred. He went to work for the Northern Wisconsin Power Company, and uh, we sold the farm to my oh. uncle and aunt. How old were you then when you sold the farm? I was, uh, that was 1937, and I was uh, 15 years old. Okay. Uh, I, I was going like going to a big city. Bayfield wasn't large. It was only about 2,000 people. How far from the farm? 37 miles from okay. our farm. But it was a, it was it was a big. I mean, as far as I was concerned, we had movie theaters, we had all kinds of things to go to, mm -hmm. and it was there. The first day that I was there unloading the, our truck that we had, uh, furniture, a girl was riding up and down the street in front of the place, and of course, what she was really doing was checking over the any new people that came to town. So I went out finally and stopped her and I said, what's up? How come you ride back and forth right in this area? And she said, well, I'm checking things out. <laughs> I said, well, okay, here I am. I'm Ralph Watt. Well, she's been my wife for 60 years. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and what was her name? Beverly Johnson. Beverly Johnson. And her uh, ancestors, uh, how? They were Swedish. They, uh, her, her, well, I should say her mother was Swedish. Her mother was born in Sweden. But her father was uh, half Sweden, half Norwegian, and uh, his father had been killed on the ore docks in Duluth, or in, mm -hmm. in Ashland, I'm sorry, uh, while loading uh, uh, out there one time. He mm -hmm. slipped and fell into the water and was mm -hmm. drowned. But uh, and his, and, and, uh, his wife kind of lost her senses, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. that, about that, and she had two small, three small children. Her, Beverly's father was one of them, and, uh, and uh, an uncle and an aunt took them in and raised the boys. A uh, good family. I, he, he, her grandfather uh, that raised the, her dad uh, owned a meat market in town, so all the years uh, he had the meat market, and then when, he, when uh, he couldn't do it any longer, his stepson, Al, Albert, uh, we, everybody called him Butch, of course he's a bu butcher, you know. And even Beverly, my wife, was as a kid, always called Butch. So uh, we had a good time, and it's a great to be married to someone that you grew up with. Oh, yeah. The uh, house, um, uh, did you live in that house for a long time, that one that you moved, where she saw you? To Bayfield? Uh -huh. No, just one year we had it. Oh, yeah, one year. It was a kind of a friendly thing between the a lady who knew a friend of my mother's, and so she said, "It's not not being used now. You go ahead and rent it." What, what street was that on? What street? How <laughs> <laughs> oh, do I remember? We didn't even have street names oh, in Bayfield, okay. but I think they are all named now. Yeah. I think it would be Fifth Street, okay. right on Lake Superior. The, the, the lake was probably I could throw a rock yeah. if I had a good strong arm. I could throw yeah. a rock in the lake. So you lived there for one year, and then where then did we you moved to another place up near the high school. Okay. So uh, we lived there, and then I graduated in 1940, and I never really got back into town again. Although I was there in the summertime running my boats, mm -hmm. but I never lived there really. I I was in school, or I got a job teaching, and I was working as a teacher. Okay, tell me about uh, high school in Bayfield. Then, uh, what sports did you play? I played basketball. That's the only sport we had. And how tall well, were you? I, we had a little baseball. I played baseball in the in the in the city leagues. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I played on the city baseball team with a couple of good ball players. That one of them who made it up to the major leagues. Who was that? His name was Don Silas. Played with Detroit Tigers. Hmm. Okay. Uh, he was very good, and I played ball with him. Okay. I was a good baseball player. 
Uh, I uh, played that, first base. I played first base. I sure did, <laughs> and uh, I played third base also. Uh, I was a good hitter, and uh, I had a good eye to handle things and so forth. And right-handed good, or left-handed? I was right-handed. Uh -huh. I had good range. But basketball was really my sport because basketball in Wisconsin is very, very important. How tall were you? I was six foot three in high school, and I weighed about 180 pounds. So you played center, probably. Were I was the, the center. Tallest guy on I the was the center, and I thought I was a pretty big guy until I went to college, and I was the smallest guy on the freshman team. Where was that? What At college? Wisconsin State College in Superior. Huh. Uh, a lot of good friends there. They weren't overly big. Moose Rensham was six four, and Ernie, his brother, was about six five, and uh, others were in that area, but the, they were all a little taller than I was. So. In high school, did you guys have a pretty good team? We had we had moderate, fairly decent teams. We we would win and lose. I think in the last couple of years, we won more than we lost. And I became pretty well known in the area because I led the league in scoring and so forth. Did you have a hook shot? Uh, not a good one, but it was okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I I was a good, powerful rebounder, mm -hmm. and I get a lot of putback stuff and so forth. Yeah. Uh, did you like your coach? I had two coaches in high school. Gordon Nelson was my favorite because he was a good basketball player. The other person was Carl Larson, and he was not a good basketball player, but he worked hard at it. Uh, so when I graduated in 1940, Gordon Nelson was, had been my coach for the last two years. So did you and this girl that uh, came to check you out, did you go together all through high school? We went together in high school. When Do you remember your first date? Uh, what you did or anything like oh, that? Oh, we, you know, we didn't have any formal dates. Her, my first real date, formal date, was the prom. And her mother made her a beautiful red dress. And when I was looking through the trunk yesterday, the old trunk, I thought I would find my uniform in there. There was the red dress. Oh. Yeah. So we had to take it out. We have to show our grandchildren. Absolutely. Uh, so what year did you graduate from high school? 1940. And uh, did you, academically, did you like school? Very much so. What were your favorite subjects? I was thrilled subjects? sciences. Chemistry, physics, I majored in it when I went to college, mm -hmm. and math. I love math. Mm -hmm. So I had an interesting combination. We all knew when the uh, Germans invaded Poland in 1939, and I was a senior in high school that year, uh, that uh, bad things were in our future. Uh, we uh, didn't uh, realize to the extent it was going to go, but it, but it was. We knew that it was a problem. So you were pretty much up on current affairs. Oh well, yeah, so. yes, we sure were. And then when when we were in college, now my first year in college it was uh, not ex extraordinary. I played basketball. Uh, I played did, football. Did you get a? I made the football team. Did you have a scholarship? Uh, I had an athletic academic. scholarship, oh, but I had an oh, academic bad. scholarship. Oh, you did. Uh, Both. Yeah. And uh, I played basketball and I played football. Uh, and then the sophomore year came, and uh, I had been rooming in a house with a fellow by the name of Mel Knudsen. We had a room, rented a room in a private home. And the next year, a fellow by the name of Clyde Gallus, football player, said to me. I'm going to put together a sort of a commune, and uh, we're going to have eight people rent this house. Uh, and would you like to be a part of it? Well, sure. My cousin Marvin Bodine and I both said, "Yeah, we'd like to be part of this." Marvin was a good football player. He was a halfback. Went into the Air Force, by the way. Uh, so uh, we were living in this house. Had four bedrooms upstairs, and we paired off two and two and two. Uh, in, the, in the first floor was a single bedroom where the two people who owned the house lived, and they had a kitchen there. But they had outfitted the basement into a first-class kitchen. And they had a toilet down there and so forth, and a shower. So they had the shower, one shower up on the second floor, they had showers for themselves or a bath on the, on the first floor, and then we had another shower down below. So we had eight guys living here. Most of them were football players. And it was fun. Uh, we broke up into groups. One man would handle the buying. He would watch the sales, and on weekends we'd go buy food. 
others did the menial chores, you know, and uh, others did cleanup, and others did cooking, and others did cleaning. So we all had jobs, and we'd rotate them, which was kind of interesting. And Clyde had that thing organized to a T. Well, on December the 7th, the day that we had set to have our girlfriends over to have a meal with us at noon, we had uh, everything ready. I mean, we had boiled the potatoes, we had made the salads, we had the desserts, we had a roast in the oven. Everything was great. Radio was going. And all of a sudden it announced that the Japs had sneak attacked on Pearl Harbor. Well, you can imagine a house full of 20-year-old men, 20 and 21, what that meant to us, you know. Just as that announcement completed, in came all the girls, all eight of them. So they had not heard that news until we told them. Of course, it was on the radio all the time after that. But uh, it was a pretty somber time. And we didn't get much of that good meal completed. It was just uh, something that we we uh, fiddled with a little bit, I would say. And then we decided to break up and go our own way and commensurate with each other. So Bev and I decided to go to a movie. So we walked downtown, which is Now, was she going to school there? She was going to school, too. Awesome. So we went downtown to a uh, theater, and it was about three-fourths of a mile to the theater or something like that. We walked. We didn't have a car. We would always walk. And uh, we watched the movie. The other day I said to her, do you remember that movie we went to? And she says, I haven't the faintest idea what it is. I don't know the name. I don't know what happened. I don't either. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that's all blocked out, but it's not there. Well, you're probably thinking about other things, yeah. And uh, when we came out of the movie, it was the most magnificent, gentle snowstorm you ever saw in your life. You know how the flakes come filtering down real slow, no wind blowing, it was just very nice. So we walked back to the dorm, and then we, I left her there. And uh, the next day in school, it was a, a deadly day, you know. Nobody had any pep or enthusiasm about anything, staff members or anybody. Well, from that moment on, now this was December. I, in, in, in about February, after the first semester was over in January, both my cousin Marvin Bodine, enlisted, he enlisted, who enlisted in the Air Force, and Clyde Gallus, who enlisted in the Navy, were gone of our, of our eight people. And by the end of the semester, three more left. They got into areas of the military that were, were favorable to them. We had all registered for the draft. And so they decided they were going to do that. So in the meantime, I was looking too. You know, it's kind of catchy. So I was looking, and I w drove down to Minneapolis, and I talked to the people in the Army Air Corps. And uh, they said, great, you know, you've got two years of college in, no? Uh, you shouldn't have any difficulty. We had to pass an exam. You shouldn't have any difficulty passing the written exam. Uh, and your health looks good. And I said, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, I'm perfect. You know, so uh, I passed the written exam. I was standing in line for, at my physical uh, and going through all of these things, and I had passed everything that I, that I knew about until I was standing there looking over the shoulder of a guy in front of me who was reading the Ishihara color charts. They're the charts with all the dots in that have numbers or letters that you can see separately. And as I looked, I was kind of sort of cheating, I guess. I looked and he read numbers differently than I saw them. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, I wonder what's wrong with him. <laughs> then uh, I uh, got my, had my turn. And I read seven or eight charts. I read them. I could read the numbers. I could see that this was a B, or this was a 9, or a 6, you know, something like that. But I was missing them. They weren't right. Uh, so the man said to me, an officer, he said, I want you to step out of line and go back and meet with Lieutenant Commander so-and-so back here. Uh, this, was the, this was not the Navy. This was the Army. It was the Army. Anyway, I went back and I met with somebody, a captain, I guess, and uh, he said uh, to me, give me a few more tests, and he said to me, you're colorblind. Did you not know that? And I said, no, 
I never do that. What do we do about it? That's my first approach. What do I do about it? He said, well, I'm going to talk with the doctor. So the doctor came in and he said, well, I'd suggest that you go on a, a high vitamin A diet. And he gave me a prescription and said, do that and come back and see us in two weeks. I did it. And I came back in two weeks and I couldn't pass that test yet. So I thought, there's something screwy here. So I went over down the street a ways and went to the Naval Recruiting Station tried to tell them I wanted to get into the Naval Air Force. And of course, they asked me if I had tried any other place. And that being honest, I said, yeah, the Air Force. <laughs> the Air Corps rejected me because I was colorblind. Well, let's check it. So they checked me. You're colorblind. Well, I went to the Navy then. They didn't take me. I went to the Marines. They didn't take me. I went to the Air Transport Command. They wouldn't take me. There were five of them all together and they would not take me. So I thought, well, I'll check the Army and see what they say. Oh, yeah, we will take you. <laughs> it doesn't make a difference whether you're colorblind or not. So I had that option. And I thought, well, if I get drafted, I'm going to be drafted into the Army. And I'm making 10 and $12 an hour, unheard of wages, you know, in that shipyard, because I was a layout man. Oh, oh, when did you start working in the I shipyard? started there as soon as that uh, uh, Second semester ended in, in, in about May, end of May. Oh, okay. I went right to work to work in the shipyard. So I said, well, gee, I might as well work in the shipyard. So I was bringing home good money, and I banked it. What were you doing in the shipyard? I was a layout man and laying out bulkheads, steel bulkheads, for cutters to come and, uh, and cut the size to, for the welders to come and weld into place. And I used... Uh, my math background a little bit in that. What kind of ships were they building? They were building uh, four, 500 foot Liberty cargo ships because they had been sinking them like crazy out on the Atlantic. So uh, I did that and then uh, I checked with my draft board and they said, well, you're fine. We're not going to call you quite yet. Go ahead and work. In fact, they had told me before, as long as I was enrolled in school that semester, if when I finished that semester, that last, you know, that second semester that year, of my second year, I would be subject to a call. So they said, we won't bother you while you're in school, but when you're out of school, fine. So I went to work from the shipyard. And uh, sure enough, they said, and finally the draft board said, in about October, I'll get your things in order because in 30 days, or within 30 days, you're going to be on your way. So I did, and uh, that night in November, I don't remember exactly the day, but there were about 2,600 of us, I think, that boarded a train in Superior for transportation south. Uh, we were from northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, and around that area, some of even from northern Michigan, the peninsula. And we didn't know where, where we were going until we were on board the train and then somebody had announced that we were going to Camp Grant, Illinois, down near Roxford, for our induction. And sure enough, that's where we ended up. We were there about a week and during that time we did all the things, you know. We had shots and we had haircuts and we had uh, issues of uniforms and we had, had our swearing-in ceremony. We did all the things and now we're soldiers, you know. Kind of interesting to me, I thought, here I am, an innocent, and all of us were kind of innocent farm kids, most of us, who knew nothing about war, except what we had read. And we were on our way to war. And I thought, I wonder, you know, about all this stuff that we're going to learn about how to kill people. It bothered me, but I wasn't a conscientious objector, but it did bother me. So out of Camp Grant, uh, they finally broke us up. They shipped us south on a number of trains. There were a lot of people at Camp Grant. Okay, I, I'm going to back up for just a second. Uh, I meant to ask you before, were you, your family pretty religious when you were growing up? Oh, yeah, church? yeah, absolutely. I had a pin for uh, not missing a Sunday school in 10 years. And what, what church did you go to? Lutheran Church. What was the name of it? Uh, you went to several, I guess. It was the Swedish place. Lutheran Church of Port Wing. And then later, when I went to Bayfield, I was at the Swedish Lutheran Church there. Oh, I couldn't be anywhere else but the Swedish Lutheran. Lutheran. These are, this is the Augustana Synod, see, it's a Swedish group. 
Uh, and um, uh, Bev, she was she went to your Beverly church. was too. Yeah, she was too. And and were you were you engaged by this time? Oh no, you? no, okay, no. You still were just. No, no. We didn't get engaged for quite a while. We talked about marriage, but uh, when I was going into service, it didn't seem fair to her that I was going to get married and leave her, and maybe be pregnant, and whatever. So we just said, we'll wait. And uh, we sort of committed ourselves to each other, but in the meantime, we said, you know, do your thing. If you want to go on a date, go on a date. She did date a few guys. I didn't have time to date that many girls, although I met one girl in Colorado Springs that I enjoyed being with, and uh, her dad was uh, one of the city uh, officers of, of Colorado Springs when I was at Camp Carson. And she loved horses, and I was a horse person. Grew up in horses, so we did a lot of riding together. But that was that was all. Okay, well let's go back to uh, so you're heading south now on the train. We're heading south, and of our group that came out of Camp Grant, some went to Camp Shelby, Mississippi. Some went to Camp Livingston, Louisiana, and my group went to Camp Claiborne, Louisiana, right outside of Alexandria. Now Alexandria is an interesting town. It was only about thirty-five thousand people. But around it, it, within a short distance, was Camp Claiborne, was Camp Livingston, Camp Beauregard, and Lake Charles Air Base. All oh, close to Washington, D.C., I guess, too. No, no. Louisiana. Oh, Louis oh, I'm sorry, I think you were Louis saying Virginia. Louisiana. Louisiana. Okay. And I tell you, that poor town with 35,000 people, it wasn't unusual to have 35,000 GIs in there on the weekend, you know? And it got to be something you didn't want to do. You know, you couldn't beat anybody. Uh, you couldn't do anything. I mean, uh, you couldn't get into places you wanted to have a drink because it was too crowded. Had you been away from Wisconsin? At, or did you no. do any traveling at all when you were a kid? No. Is this the first time you were really away from it? First time I ever left and went any place. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, we did our basic training in Camp Claiborne. About, uh, now this is in uh, December. And, and about, uh, we, we got to leave uh, after Christmas. We didn't get to leave before, but we were in basic training for eight weeks at that time. At the end of the eight weeks, we were given a leave for 10 days. We could do what we wanted. I elected to go home. So I got a train ticket and went all the way up to Minneapolis, and my dad came down and met us in Minneapolis. And I stayed home for a few days, and then I had to come back, go to Minneapolis, and go back down again. A lot of guys uh, stayed around the area. Uh, some did what I did, and uh, some just played. Uh, so anyway, now we're back. we are finished our basic training, and now it's time to really get into war training. Basic training is nothing. We were a, a part of the Third Army maneuvers in Louisiana for the next two months. We hardly saw a cot or a campground. We slept outside all the time. And we traveled all over Louisiana, through every swamp in the state, it seemed to me like. We met every reptile that you could, every insect we could, and we all became acquainted with chiggers. I don't know whether you know no, chiggers I know or not. I know chiggers. They Indian drive area. you nuts. Yep. <laughs> and uh, bobcats wandered in and out of our camp. Uh, bull snakes would, would crawl into our bedrolls. They were harmless. We lost uh, three or four people due to snakes, uh, water moccasins and coral snakes, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But it was tough, hard, hard training. This is when we did our 35-mile hikes. We did our five-mile runs with packs. And uh, even though it was winter time, it still got hot days. And one day, I was coming in on a five-mile run, and I saw the church steeple up ahead where we were heading for. That's the last I remember. I was within a few blocks of it, and I passed out. Mm -hmm. I had sunstroke. I had that problem all my life now, even living here in the desert. I can't stay in the sun too long. So anyway, uh, we were getting to be a pretty good, tough outfit. But the thing that I liked about down there was the fact that General Wick, who was Division Artillery Commander, we call him Divardi Com, Divardi Commander, 
he was a kind of a guy who studied recruits' records and saw where he might best place them. And I was placed after basic training into division artillery. And they used me because I was acquainted with using aiming circles. I don't know whether you know what they are or not, but they're a tripod. You have a circle in the center. and You can shoot azimuths and so forth. Mm -hmm. Uh, I knew how to use that. I knew how to use a transit. I knew trigonometry well. I was a good trig student. I knew all the functions. Uh, I could do all the math. I was a good slide rule person. I could handle a slide rule like you couldn't believe. So he called me in one day and said to me, I'm going to put you in, I'm going to give you a rank of corporal. Now here's a guy who just finished basic training and I'm a corporal. I'm going to give you a rank of corporal and I want you to become an observer for us, which means that uh, you're going to go up forward and you're going to pick out targets and you're going to sit up there and direct the gun's fire. But you have a crew with you. You have about five, four or five guys and they're what you call a chain gang. So I could say, okay, I want to know how far it is from this point over here to this point over here because I needed the base. Then I needed to take an aiming circle over there and shoot along that base and then shoot over to my target so I had that angle. Did the same thing on this side. Long as I know three things about a triangle, I can solve all the rest of the triangle, see? Which is exactly what I did. I could tell you exactly how far it was out to that target that I wanted to hit. We were good at it. We had, I had a good team. They were quick. They, they, they got out the chain. All they did was to run. We had run 300 foot steel tapes and run off these 300 foot tapes and so forth and check out how far it was. And you're not exactly right, but when you fire that first round out there, you want to hope you're close. And you do. Usually I prefer to fire over if I can. Because if I fire over and I'm shooting at an enemy, they don't want to go that direction. I got them pinned, see? So I, I, then the next round is I estimate from where I'm at with my glasses, I use it. We had a 10 power scope, you know. I could tell about how far it was, and I'd ask them to lower their guns down so far so I'd come about the same distance short. If I were good at it, I would be right where I wanted to be. And then all I need to do is up half the way and I'd call for fire for effect, which is a mean to load all the guns, fire everything. And we just pound the hang out of the place, you know. Now in, in artillery, there's four guns. They're, they're all 105 millimeter howitzers. Or if you're in a bigger battery, they're 155s. But if you have A, B, and C, you have three batteries, you've got 12 guns and we'd load, unload under the target. And each of these projectiles weighed about, had about 27 pounds of TNT in them. They're 105 how millimeter howitzers, which is a 4.1 inch barrel. And uh, we got to be a pretty darn good outfit. One day uh, I was notified, and here I am. I'm still how, far, how far from your guns would you normally be? Uh, three miles, four miles. Okay. And the target usually, the range of the guns were about seven miles. The targets were usually about two miles to three miles out. Uh, one day I was notified, I'm still a corporal, see, notified that uh, we were going to have a special display for some visiting dignitary, some civilians and some generals. And I already, we had been up in this area so many times and I had already learned different target spots and so forth. And the colonel who was in charge of our area at that time said to the visitors, any particular target out there you want us to shoot at? Well, we knew where everything was. So somebody said, yes, there's a big pine tree out there. And it was about three miles out, a big pine tree, you could see. And so I thought, well, I know that I can get in pretty close. So we fired a round over. We fired a round short, and the third round we hit the tree. Now, I'm not kidding you, this tree was probably about nothing but luck, just plain luck. <laughs> we hit the tree, and of course all the O's and ah's and so forth, so I sort of got a, I, in fact I do have written commendations from General Wick on that someplace, I don't know where it is now. But that was kind of funny. I liked the artillery. Then. Uh, 
General Wick called me in and he said, uh, this is in December, he said, uh, with your background, I'm going to recommend you and a number of other fellows from the outfit uh, to go to college in what's called the Army Specialized Training Program. And I thought about it, he said, you get college credit, you know, you, it's, it's good to, when you come back out, you've got college credit. So I thought, man, that's going to help me, you know. So I gave up my position. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you this. He was, he was so proud of all the things that I was doing. One day he called me in and said, uh, I want you to set up a class. I've got some second lieutenants that need some help on their trig. So I did. I met with them three or four times on trig functions and slide rule use and so forth. And that was my first experience as a teacher. I think it drew me back into the area of teaching because I wasn't planning on being an engineer. Hmm. Had you thought about going to OCS school? Oh yeah, I was after. They were after me all the time on that. You didn't want to? No, nope. I didn't want to because I wanted to go home. <laughs> I wanted to go home as soon as I could, and I figured if I went to officers training school, they're going to keep me here some way or other, and it worked out that way exactly that way. I even had an offer of a battlefield commission. I turned that down too. But anyway, he said, I want you to go to AS, I think you should go to ASTP, Army Specialized Training Program. So I thought, well, you know, that's not a bad idea. I get some more credits and I shorten my college time when I get back out. And uh, lo and behold, they sent me to Rutgers University, New Brunswick, New Jersey. And there I met up with some of the finest men ever. We were all college students, all capable, and we sat in classes and engineering classes. We were primarily going to be engineers for the U.S. Army. And we were there for about five months. And all of a sudden, heavy casualties in the North African campaign. They needed every man they could get. So they said, we're going to cancel the program. Bang. It was done. I even played football at Rutgers for a little while uh, as a GI. But uh, then I, I was shipped out. I didn't know where we were going to go, nor did the other guys around me, but we all broke up into different, sent different places. My group that I was with was sent to Camp Carson, Colorado. And there I ended up with the 104th Infantry Division. I had been with the 103rd Infantry Division down in Louisiana. Now I'm with the 104th Infantry Division. This is all written out, by the way, in there. And uh, I didn't get into the artillery. I was really disappointed. I thought, that's logical. That's where I'd go. No, they put me in a heavy weapons company, which consists of two platoons of machine, heavy machine guns and, 81 mil, and one platoon of 81 millimeter mortars. Well, there's some connection between mortars and artillery, but not really heavy machine guns. Now, the heavy machine gun is different from a light machine gun. Light machine guns are air-cooled. Heavy machine guns are water-cooled. They have a barrel of water surrounding the gun barrel. And that, that gun and the water in it weighs 90 pounds heavy to carry. The gunner carries it. The second gunner carries the tripod which weighs 75 pounds. And the, the idea is that when you have to set up quick, the second gunner runs up, he flips the tripod over, it lands on its three legs, and the gunner comes up and he planks the gun in place, and immediately the number three man, usually a PFC, he's got an ammunition case there, and he's up there feeding the belts in, and you're ready to fire in seconds, you know. That's how it worked. The only problem was when we got to Holland, those guns were dang heavy when we had to cross those little canals in Holland. They're not very wide. Wide as this room. But they're deep. They're four and five feet deep. And when you get down on those suckers in November, you get wet. And when you get out, the clothes freeze. So we tried to jump them. And it's amazing how many people we got lost due to ruptures at that time. With these, you hit the ground and you wouldn't get quite far enough and you'd catch yourself and strain yourself and end up rupturing mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. So we had those casualties which, are, which were a problem. But anyway, uh, 
I became very proficient. I, I'm, I, I've had a gun in my hand ever since I was a kid. I was hunter, I killed deer, and shot a lot of rabbits and stuff like that. Birds, pheasants, I was good with a shotgun. So it wasn't very difficult for me to qualify as expert in all the guns. I was a 45 Colt expert, I was a 30 caliber carbine expert, I was a 30 caliber Garand rifle expert. I was an expert on a light machine gun, and I was an expert on a heavy machine gun. <laughs> Um, we need to take a break. Yeah. Uh, I'll get back to that Band of Brothers thing in a little bit, but let's see, where did I leave off of that? Uh, you're still in Camp Carson, uh, and you're getting... Okay, we were, the, we were mountain training. Why were we mountain training? We were no longer in the desert, down in North Africa. Mm -hmm. So therefore... Italy. We were now, because of the Italian campaign, we had to become mountain proficient. So the, Camp Carson became the logical spot to go. Uh, it was there that uh, we did a lot of heavy training and trapping through the mountains and field exercises all the time. Uh, we didn't have any maneuvers like we had in Louisiana. Uh, after a few months at Camp Carson, and we had a new general, by the way, by the team of Terry Allen. You may never have heard of Terry Allen. I've, I've had. But Terry Allen was uh, called Terrible Terry. And he had been relieved of command of the 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One, in North Africa because of the heavy casualties the division had sustained. Uh, but he was a good man, a good general. They brought him back here to this green division, the 104th, made up of many, many college students, like I said, who came in from ESTP, although the, the original cadre had been up in Camp Adair, Oregon, and then from there had gone to uh, Arizona to Camp White uh, because they were training in desert training, but they were way understaffed. So suddenly here we come with about 7,000 guys out of ASTP. We now build a complement of this division up to 12,000 people in a hurry, which is a complement of our division. And Terry Allen takes over. Terry Allen had a philosophy that he never was able to use during North African campaign, but in city and house to house fighting, he wanted his attacks to always be night attacks. And the reason for it was that they can't see to shoot you. You know, and if they can't see, but you can see if they're you can see them if they're, they're shooting at you. Uh, the only problem with night attacks is you can't see where you're stepping. And the Germans were getting wise to this, especially after we t beat them badly in a couple of battles there in Germany. They put out these little shoe mines, not any bigger than a matchbox. And uh, the, the lid was set up just a little bit on the primer, and if you stepped on the ground or stepped on the top of that box, or the, it would explode and blow your foot off. Now, that's not death dealing unless you fall backwards and hit your head on another one, which some people did but it sure puts you out of commission. And so uh, they were quite effective. We, we lost a lot of, one of my best friends lost his leg or his foot and they sent him back to uh, Walter Reed uh, and he ended up being a doctor for the rest of his life. He had no intention. He was with me at Rutgers and was yeah. going to be an engineer. So shoe, shoe mines were, were deadly and we were deathly afraid of them. I hated that patrols at night when you didn't know where oh, you were yeah. going. Mm. Uh, and when you got caught on a shoe mine, how do you get out of them, you know? You have to go back in your own footsteps, but you can't see your footsteps. So you, uh, you, you just go, you just do it, you know? Anyway, uh, we were, the division was ordered to go to New York. Camp Kilmore. And they packed us into 17 trains. I remember that well. I was amazed. 17 trains, you know. And shipped us across country to New York. We ended up in Camp Kilmore, New Jersey, near New Brunswick, where I had been going to school. Uh, we were told that we would be disembark or embarking. Uh, out of there and within a, a few days 
We were given some special equipment that we hadn't had before. Some new things were, our, our field jackets were ruined or worn out. Our, our fatigues were shot. Our underwear was shot. We got reissues on all of this stuff. And uh, we had new boots, too. Up until that time, we had been wearing a uh, legging type of uh, putties, they called them. We had uh, worn those. Now, in Camp Kilmer, we got new combat boots, which you know what they, what they are. And uh, we were not giving any leave into New York at all. We were to, to give away anybody, our position, where we were, or what was going on. We didn't know that there were two other div infantry divisions in the city, or in the, around New York area, that were also being shipped out at the same time. So they came and picked us up. We loaded on ferry boats, and we went across the harbor to New York piers. We loaded on a ship called the George Washington, which had been a passenger liner. Nice ship, big ship, and we were treated very, very well. We were fed well, and we had adequate space. We carried 6,000 of us of the 12,000 on that one ship. And two other ships were loaded with 3,000 more each. And then you had two more infantry divisions that had to be loaded on other, other ships. So it was a very busy time there in New York Harbor. Then the time comes to sail. We sail out past the Statue of Liberty, and here's a fleet of Navy vessels, almost as far as you can see, mostly destroyers, one or two cruisers in there, because the cruisers handled uh, helicopters and so forth. But uh, it was really an interesting thing for me to watch this assembling that was taking place and how they fitted together. The three, the three, the three infantry divisions on, on their six troop ships, or nine troop ships, I should say, were all sort of collected in the near the center. Not all together, but they were collected near the center with uh, destroyers all around them. Uh, this was 1944? Yeah, yeah, it was. We were on our way, way to, to France. Was um, uh, the threat of German subs as, as uh, dire as it had been a couple years earlier? I, I, I wouldn't think so because we only had two sub scares during that time when the destroyers would roar around amongst us and drop depth charges, you know, and mm -hmm. so forth. So uh, obviously with that large, we had 90 ships. 90 ships were crossing at one time. And they were flanked by Navy ships all over the place, you know. Some in the center, some out on the side. There are a lot of sonar going, I'll tell you. Anyway, we took off and uh, we sailed and we knew we were going to Europe, but we didn't know where. We it possibly Italy, that's what we thought because we'd been mountain trained. And we got into hot weather. We must have been down near the equator. We got into cold weather. They were zigzagging all over. And finally we got off the tip of England, southern tip of England. The convoy breaks up. Navy ships stay with uh, this group here and they go to ports in England. Navy ships stay with another group, and they go to ports in England, and so forth and so on. Navy ships stayed with us, what do we do? We don't go to England. We go right into Omaha Beach. And we had to unload on, uh, on, into landing craft. Now the beach is all mangled up, wreckage all over the place. This would have been how long after D-Day? About a say? month. Okay. And uh, we, we go right into the beach, and we our transport, we walk. We walk actually a few miles inland uh, to an orchard where we scatter all over these farms in there, our whole division. And we pull out our shelter halves and put them together and make a tent and so forth and so on. There we stayed for a few days, now just about a week. Let me ask you, um, you had mentioned um, a platoon, uh, a, a machine gun platoon or uh, What's that comprised of? How many guys? And four what? squads. Uh, four squads. Each squad has a heavy gun. And how, guy, how many guys in there a squad? Are, there are eight guys to a squad. Okay. There's a gunner, an assistant gunner, and there's the rest of them are all ammo carriers. They're riflemen, but they're, they're ammo carriers 
That's their job to get ammunition up. It's, it's and do you guys defend yourselves, or do you have other platoons of riflemen that uh, accompany you? We have a riflemen that are nearby. Uh -huh. So yeah, we defend ourselves too, but there, there are rifle companies all around us too. Okay. And you had a mortar squad. In we had a mortar team? mortar platoon, and mortar they also platoon. have four eighty-one millimeter mortars. They have a gunner, and they have a. Those are heavy plates to, to and the tubes are heavy too. Explain the, 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 the function of how a mortar works. Well, the eighty-one mortar mortars have a heavy plate, and in the plate there's a socket hole, and on the end of the mortar tube there's a socket, and then there's a tripod, not a tripod, a bipod, that the mortar fastens to, so you can angle it at different angles by how high you raise the tripod. The bipod, it gets only two legs. Uh, and the purpose of that would be to go over hills or something. Oh, yeah, the to, lob, hit, to lob, 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 shots. lob shots in. Right. And 81 millimeter, now your millimeter is about 25 millimeters to the inch, so it's a little over three inches. And they drop this mortar shell, which has a fins on it, onto the pin at the bottom which fires the charge and it propels the mortar up to where you want to go. Now, mortars are not very accurate. You think you know where they're going, but sometimes they don't go where you want them to go. Uh, they were, as far as I was concerned, not effective in most cases. It isn't like a gun where you can fire right at somebody. But the mortars can also conceal themselves. Guns can't. Guns sit out in the open, you see. Mm -hmm. Unless you dig a deep hole, and then even then they can spot them with flashes and so forth. But mortars, you can't tell where they're coming from. They're just like out of suddenly out of the air, and these mortars start raining down their shells. But they did their job, and they caused a lot of havoc among, just emotionally, mm -hmm. among the enemy. You know. Yeah. And uh, heavy uh, armament uh, platoon like yours, probably. Um, uh, the enemy is focusing on you guys. I mean, you're probably more concerned about you than riflemen yeah. here and there. And in a counterattack, for example, they're always after the machine guns. You know, everything. 88s can zero in on you, mm -hmm. and they try to blow you out. And usually, we have foxholes that we hide in, and unless you get a direct hit in a foxhole, you can weather those things. Except when you get down into areas that where there are a lot of trees, and there were trees in certain areas of Germany that we get into, then the shells begin to burst when they hit the trees, and you'd rain shrapnel down all around you, you know. So, uh... Okay, so you're back in the uh, orchard. Yeah. Well, the in, the or in the orchard, our captain was Captain Henry Cagle, an All-American from US West Point, All-American football mm -hmm. player. He was a good man. Uh, we had been training with him for some time. However, he got sick. He was the, oh, 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 well, he was the captain of, of the company. Of the whole company. That includes? M Company with the three platoons in it. Okay, so of, of your artillery, I mean, not your artillery, but your heavy, heavy, yeah, heavy yeah. weapons. He, he company. was a company commander. Okay. And there are three companies in a, in a battalion. And there are three battalions in a regiment. And there are three regiments in a division. See how the whole thing mm -hmm. worked? It's three, 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 all the way oh, through. Okay. And that's all written up in there, too. Just so if you want to check on something, you can do so. Uh, anyway, but the people that did the work were the platoon people. Let, let me tell you, they're the ones that had to get out there and do the thing. The platoon rifle, the rifle squads are the ones that had to probe and dig in and go out on recon and so forth all the time. We didn't have to do that with heavy weapons. Our job was to support them. Our job was to pave the way for them. Now we could lay down a terrible field of fire because we had four machine guns that could fire 600 rounds a minute. We don't always do that because it burns the barrels out. But uh, we can fire them in bursts. And when we're counterattacked by them, riflemen lay flat on their bellies in front of us and we knock off the, the Germans coming in. And we did that, you know, we were very effective. Later on, when we were in Stolberg, Germany, they added 250 caliber machine guns to our company. 
To those, each, not two companies, to each platoon. Those are really heavy. Aren't they're they? heavy. Well, they're heavy for half inch, half inch guns. Yeah. I mean, uh, the reason for that was because sometimes we had ranges longer than the 30 caliber, oh. and the idea was to disrupt them as much as we possibly could. You know. So uh, you said Captain Kegel. Captain Kegel. C A G L E became very ill while in France. And Lieutenant Spencer took over as captain. Not a good, not a good captain. He was not a good man. He was a coward. I'm sorry to say. He's died now. Uh, I hope his family doesn't read this, but I'll tell you, he did everything he could to avoid his own personal being in combat. He'd send people out uh, on some silly things that uh, were ridiculous. We had better captains later on. But that's what happens sometimes in warfare. Uh, uh, we left the orchard suddenly. Oh yeah, I want to forget to tell you this. They took all of our trucks and our drivers. We had shipped everything over. Suddenly word came down. All of our trucks and drivers were reporting to take part in the Red Ball Express. The, the American soldiers were approaching Paris at the time when we were in the orchard. They needed supplies, they needed gasoline, they needed ammunition, they needed food. Every truck in the area was designed to haul from the ports. Now part of our outfit, a few squads, or a few companies I should say, not mine, were sent into Cherbourg to help get Cherbourg ready because Cherbourg had been bypassed. It had to help get it ready to handle ships coming in to unload stuff. There were still Germans in Cherbourg. They hadn't been able to get out. They were trapped. So the, our, the guys that were sent in from our outfit had to clear them out. And today, if you go to Cherbourg, there's a sign out in front that honors the 104th Infantry Division for uh, their help in getting the Germans out of the place. Uh, then everybody assembles back, and the next thing you know, we're assigned, if you ever believe this, to the 1st Canadian Army. Who ever thought we were going to be in the 1st Canadian Army? The 1st Canadian Army, and I have a map in there for you, that shows us going up the coast all the way to Belgium where we had to clear up little pockets of, of resistance. We had to get into the city of Brussels and open that up. Antwerp. Those ports were important to us, you see. That was our task. We finally ended up in Holland. Now up until that time we had not run into heavy combat time. Do you remember your first combat experience? I can remember mine. What, what was that? When was that? Scary, terribly scary. But once you realize that you got a job to do, you settle in. Uh, there's some emotion. Mo mostly, I found that I had to calm guys down who were overly nervous and tell them we could do this. We can do this thing, you know. Okay, and you were you a sergeant at this oh, point? Oh yes. Okay, so what was your job then? At that time I was a squad sergeant. We call a buck sergeant with three stripes. I was a gunner, an assistant gunner, and I also had six ammunition carriers or riflemen with me. And uh, we did a good job. How many sergeants would be? There'd be, uh, well, there are three. The there are three, uh, so there are three squads. Sergeant, one sergeant for each squad. There's one sergeant. That's a plain, plain buck sergeant, smallest sergeant rank you can get. Yeah. And over the over the sergeants would be a uh, platoon sergeant. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually the platoon sergeant had three stripes up and two rockers. Mm -hmm. I became a platoon sergeant. I spent most of my war career as a platoon sergeant. The casualty rate among platoon sergeants was not terribly high. It's kind of interesting. The platoon sergeant ran the company. He really ran the company. It was his job to make sure everybody was involved where they were. Sometimes the platoon sergeant did nothing more than follow up the rear and make sure everything got set up right. The people who were the heavy casualties were second lieutenants, who were the platoon leaders. They were either platoon leader or assistant or platoon leaders. These young lieutenants would come in there. If they lasted a few days, it was a miracle sometimes. They took their job seriously and they led their men. They led their men and got killed. Mm -hmm. 
that's when my first combat took place. One of our lieutenants was killed. And, and it, uh, really, it wasn't until Holland. We had had little pockets of things there were lots of times, but when we got to Holland, we ran into heavy, heavy German resistance. And it was our job to take the city of Breda, B-R-E-D-A, up on the Mark Canal, M-A-R-K. And uh, it was heavy going, hard going. The canals were uh, absolutely impossible. Tanks mostly could crawl over the small ones. But the bigger ones they'd drop into and couldn't get out of. They'd stand on their nose, you know. They'd stick their gun barrels into the dirt on the other side. Uh, so it was really tough going. And we got to almost Breda. Uh, and, and suddenly, and I can't remember the days, but I, I think I have written down there. Suddenly, uh, we were ordered to go to Germany. And I want to tell you, overnight, we left one afternoon. We pulled out of the front lines. We were right in the front. The Germans were right in front of us. We were shooting back and forth. That afternoon, we retreated back, loaded into trucks. We took off for Germany, and the next day in the afternoon, we were in the lines of Germany, and that night, we were assaulting Hill 287. Now here's where the big red one comes back into the picture. They had left North Africa, they had been a leading infantry division in the beach on Omaha, and here they were now at, at a town called Stolberg, Germany, or Aachen. Aachen is the nearest big town, A-A-C-H-E-N. It's just in a hilly area and right in the center of what's called the Siegfried Line. Pillboxes are all over the place. We come into there and we get orders that that night we unload up our trucks, we get our gear, that night we were fed and we took off that night up, up uh, to capture Stolberg. Well, we captured Stolberg. It took us that night and the next day. But we got a little rest the following day. Then the next thing is Hill 287, which looks over all of this, because German 88s were firing on us from above, and, and uh, we had to get them out of there. The 1st Division had been one solid week trying to take Hill 287. Not a very big hill. That's only 287 feet. That's why it's called That's that. That's all I see. But uh, they couldn't get it. They had casualties. They had to be pulled back. They were, they were a broken up outfit. They had been hurt badly. I said uh, they needed to recharge themselves. And so here we come. We didn't, they had been attacking the daytime, day after day after day. So what does Terry Allen do? He sends us up there at night. And you know, we were on top of the German trenches on the hillside there in those pillboxes and gun, gun emplacements before they even knew it. We were quiet, but it was cold. Man, it was cold. This was November. And the Germans were all huddled inside trying to keep warm. And we were out there coming up. Well, we finally had to give a position away because there were some people in trenches. And so we used hand grenades on them. I was part of the group. I was coming right behind the infantry people. Uh, we were ready to set up our guns immediately if we had a tough point. And then we got into pillboxes. And immediately they began to open fire on us. So we could set up and fire on them too. But we had to be careful because the gun flashes give our position away. <coughs> but the mortars could pound them pretty good, so they did. That's what I was going to say. A pillbox, it'd be hard to hit anybody, wouldn't it? Because they just have little slits. Well, yeah, but you could pepper them and you maybe get some bullets inside the ricochet around, oh. you know. It's true. Uh, so we, we managed to continue up that hill. They, they, had they had trenches connecting every pillbox. They could wander back through these things, and they withdrew. We called in artillery on these things, you know, so they would bang off, and they didn't do much damage to them, but they sure made a rocket inside, I'm sure, and scared those guys pretty good. We got up to the crest just at daybreak, and somehow or other, I and my squad were right up there with the riflemen. And of course, we wanted to get our machine gun set up right quick. So, Roscoe Cook, good kid, good friend of mine, was with me. And at that time, I was the squad leader. 
he had gotten the, we'd got the gun set up, and suddenly a rifle fire started, just single shots, boom. And people would yell. And we realized there was a sniper in there someplace that was causing all kinds of havoc, and he did. He must have killed 15 guys that morning. And so Roscoe and I decided we were going to try to spot that sucker, and if we could find his slit, I'll, I'll pour a thousand rounds through that slit if I have to. So uh, we took turns. We would look, pop our head up to see if we could see any movement, and then duck down, and Cookie would do it, and then I have somebody else over here doing it, and we'd change our positions so we weren't always in the same place. And it was Cookie's turn, he popped his head up, and he was probably about four or five feet from me, and I heard that bullet that hit him right in the throat. Of course, he bled to death right there. I crawled over to him and I had him in my arms, and he died. He couldn't say anything. He was gone. It, it, it hurts so bad, you know. I wasn't scared for me. I was. The thing that I thought about was his wife, whom he had just married before coming overseas. And I had always, and now she's a beautiful girl, and I'd always kidded him and said, you know, if you don't come back from this thing, I know what I'm going to do, you know, inferring I was going to look her up. And that's all I thought about. So you had gotten pretty close to the guys in your Oh, yeah, he was squad. only 60, 70 feet away from us at the time. No, but I mean, no, I mean, I mean, you had become attached emotionally oh, to Oh, we had your, lived together your, your, for your, months. Your yeah, we did everything together. I used to go out on a double date with this girl from Colorado Springs that I went with, Betsy and, 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 and Cook's wife, and he. Mm -hmm. So we, yeah, we knew each other well. well. So that was our first casualty in the company that day. I wasn't very much good for the rest of the day, but there were some riflemen that took it up, and they went down through some of these trenches, trenches and tossed the German bodies out of the trenches that we had killed. There had been a lot of them that had been casualties, so they could get moved through there quickly. And they finally found out where that sniper was firing from. And so we laid a, had a lot of fire laid in on them, uh, howitzers and also mortars and machine guns. And while that was going on, these guys were coming up on the side, creeping in another tunnel or another trench. Uh, they uh, finally got close and radioed back to cease firing. And they made a dash for the door. They dropped a Bangalore torpedo up there. I don't know whether you know what they are, but they're, long, they're long tubes. Mm -hmm. Blew that door right off. Because when the explosion occurred, I popped my head up and I looked and saw that opening. And immediately, half a dozen hand grenades went in there. And there were some other men in there besides the sniper. But that sniper, I had to admire him. You know, this man did his job. He was there. He was a deadly shot, just a deadly shot. It was, everything was headshots. And you only had a fraction of a second to squeeze that off and, and get that person. But I was really happy he was gone. You know. Then you look out in front. We could now get our heads up and look. And there were pillboxes all over up here, you know, big suckers. And they were still loaded with men. So we had a lot of slugging to do in there. It took us a long time to clear that up. And then we had a number of towns in there that we had to go through. There were towns like Eichweiler, Westweiler, Inden, I-N-D-E-N. Uh, all of them are on the map. They're small little communities. And uh, they're, they're, we had to clean them house to house fighting. Germans were retreating and would go back to set up a defensive position exactly. each of those little things. And, and these then, houses. And they would. And these basements. And they had a lot of the basements, walls knocked out so you could move from one basement to the next. You get into a house and move into it and go along and all of a sudden you find guys behind you. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't good. You see, I mean, I've watched Combat, the... Uh, series that used to be on back in the 50s and 60s yeah. and a lot of times they're in going house to house and they they seemed like they had a routine where you cover each other and be going along. Did you they have do. Anything, 
have. You do, you do. But, uh, you know, uh, you'd go through a, the house and all of a sudden you think the house is all cleared and suddenly be two houses behind you there's gunfire taking place, you know. And we thought that house was cleaned up, but they'd sneak back under the underground walls. And we did, didn't discover that right away. It took us a day or two before we figured it out. Did you take many prisoners? Oh, lots of prisoners there. And we finally took prisoners. Uh, later on we took them. Thousands of prisoners. Thousands of them. I'm not kidding you. They were something beyond belief. But, uh... I mean, you're talking about, like, like the guy that was in the pillbox popping people off. I mean, he probably knew oh, he, wasn't, he wasn't gonna... There was no chance there for him. He wasn't gonna no, survive. There was no chance for him. Uh, uh, well, from there, that tough area, the, when we finally broke out of there after about a, almost a month of heavy house-to-house -house fighting in these towns, we finally got to Duren, D-U-R-E-N, Germany, which is located on the Rohr River, R-O-E-R, -E which comes out of the hills and feeds into the Rohr, I mean the Rhine, R Rhine River. And the river could be a trickle or it could be a roaring flood, depending on the amount of water those people up above were letting out of their, from their dams. And they were good at it. The German army had taken over those dams and we could send squads across the creek or the river and we weren't sure they were going to get back, you know. Because when they came back they had no way of crossing that flowing river. So we had to be very careful about that. But in Dern, uh, I was there at Christmas time. And all of the town city had been evacuated. There was not a German citizen in the place. Pretty good sized community. And we had no heat. Nothing worked. So we had to use wood. And we burned, we had fires. We burned up furniture, we burned up anything we possibly could in order to give us some heat that we could exist there. And we stayed in Duren for quite a while. Now, during that period of time, is that when the Battle of Bulge was going on back in Belgium? Battle of Bulge started on December the 15th. And I'm talking about the first, the, 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 up to Christmas time right in there. We knew that they were down there trying to get through. In fact, word came that we were, they were in Liège, Belgium, and that we were cut off. But that didn't stop us from securing Duren. Uh, and they diverted all of their energy south, so we didn't have much opposition. There's one thing that I did do, and I've never been proud of it. I was in, uh, sitting in the third story of a house, and I noticed that in a courtyard of a big house across the river, not very far away, less than a half a mile, the Germans were bringing out all of their big kettles. They were going to serve a Christmas feast. This is Christmas Day. I alerted the 81st of the mortar platoon about this, and the platoon commander came over, and we studied this thing a little bit, and I said, what do you think? This is Christmas. And he says, if they assemble out there in that courtyard, I'm going to nail them. And he did. He outranked me. He was a second lieutenant. <laughs> but uh, uh, we... Uh, I could have let it go, you know, not paid attention, but we sure destroyed their Christmas dinner and they had a lot of casualties out there too because he dropped some rounds right smack in the middle of that whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'd have been there the next day to... That's war. Yeah, to take, you know. So, yeah. so anyway, we, uh, we couldn't cross the Roar River at th that time. Everything was diverted south to help in the Battle of the Bulge. The green kids that had been put in the line, the 106th Infantry Division, came right from the States and came up into that area and were assigned their defense positions. They had no knowledge whatsoever they were, they were getting. Nobody anticipated in the Hertzkin Force that this was going to happen. And when the tanks, German tanks hit, they ran right through their whole positions. And at Malmody, they killed quite a few of them. I wanted to ask you about uh, did you get replacements? Oh, all the time. And how did they meld in uh, to with you guys? I, mean, I was what, always what? sorry to get replacements because I knew that they weren't going to last too long. They do dumb things. 
they'd report in to me and I'd assign them where I wanted them to be for the night and I'd caution them. I'd say, no smoking. Well, nobody's going to see me. I said, no smoking, period. No smoking. You know, because people can smell that smoke and they can trace that down. Invariably, some guy would smoke and somebody would crawl up and drop a grenade in and kill him, you know. Uh, all kinds of things like that. That They took chances. They, they didn't realize. You get wise after you're in combat a few days. You get smart. But these guys, some of them were awfully dumb. A lot of them survived, but there's a lot of them that lost their lives, too. And no matter what would, would it Would it uh, endanger you got you more so, having them, these green Well, troops. they weren't effective, that's for sure. Yeah, I suppose that to a degree it did, but what are you going to do? You have to have people carrying ammunition for you. Oh, okay, yeah. And, uh, and ammunition, casual, the ammunition carriers were casualty because they had to run back to pick up more ammo and run up with it to the guns. Mm -hmm. The guns are useless without ammo. They carried everything they could. Each, am each guy had a rifle and two 50 pound, or, uh, you know, 50 caliber or 30 caliber pound uh, machine gun ca cases. And we'd run with those, and they're hard to run with. I wanted to ask you, too, the training that you had back in the States, uh, did that stand you in good stead Excellent. in combat? Excellent. From the time Terry Allen took over, it was well worth it. He saved the lives of a lot of people, mm -hmm. uh, primarily through his night fighting. Mm -hmm. We may have gotten hurt on other things, but we didn't have the, we had enough casualties. In our, in our, uh, division, we had 3,200 deaths, and we had uh, over 80 people, 85 people or something like that missing in action, and we had a lot of other casualties, but uh, that's, a, that's a fairly high percentage. I look at the deaths in, in Iraq, there were, what, 3,000 something now. We had that many in, in our outfit. Yeah. Um, different war, though, different different fighting. Yeah. The, um, well, I guess what I meant also was had you done things over and over and over again, so it be, almost became second nature as oh, far absolutely. as your duties and things like that. That uh, you know, you you feel clean a feel clean a gun in the dark. We did that lots of times. Put all the thing back together totally in the darkness. And how about your um, your faith? Did that help keep you going? Absolutely, you think? absolutely. You know, God was looking over me. Uh, I never got really hurt. I had a little sliver of shrapnel catch me in the back uh, after I crossed the Roar Ro River heading toward Cologne. Mm -hmm. Some shells had exploded not too far away and we had hit the ground and this piece hit me in the back. And it, it didn't hurt much. I knew it was hit because I could feel it burning. Mm -hmm. And I, a medic came over and we pulled my shirt up. He looked at it and he says, I think I can get that out of there. He hauled it out. He Bandaged it up, with, put on medication in it, and bandaged it up, and away we went. Never reported it. Somebody said to me, you didn't get a Purple Heart for that? I said, I would be ridiculous to ask a Purple Heart for that. I had guys that lost hands and feet and body parts. This is nothing. But uh, the thing that has strangely happened to me is when we got up on the ridge above the Rhine River, and looking down, were these two giant spires on this church in Cologne, this Catholic church. Okay, now, um, is this about that Christmas time? Or this, is this is after. After. Oh. after. Well, well, let's go back to your Christmas. Let's get up to there. Where, um, where were you again? Uh, in Durham, Germany. In Durham. And so where did you There was nothing there? particularly unique about Christmas there. All we were doing was trying to struggle to keep I, warm. I, I know, but I mean, I'm just picking up the chron chron chronology. Of well, so from there, you? once we got across the Roar River, then we moved forward, and that's when we got up. And we did it at a time when the Germans were retreating back from Bastogne. Okay. So we had a chance to move out pretty good, and we covered 10 or 15 and how miles. How did you get across the river? Oh, that was easy. They weren't. They, they had abandoned the, the dam control up there. So oh, because you could just walk, or you didn't have to have pontoon bridges or no, things like no, that? No, no, we got across that without any problem. Okay. And, uh, then we got to the crest above the Rhine River and saw the cathedral, and we went down to Cologne, and we saw the Remagen Bridgehead. Bridge over there wasn't a bridgehead yet, and everybody was happy. We were on a rush to try to get to that bridge, 
We knew that charges had to have been set, but why they hadn't exploded, nobody knew. Uh, we had it with us the 3rd Armored Infantry, or the 3rd Armored Regiment. This is a tank ar division. I should say division, not regiment. This is a tank division. And they were with us through a lot of this campaign and gave us support and would probe with their tanks every once in a while. And, uh, lost a lot of them sometimes in minefields that they were heading across an open area and tracks would blow off. And then we'd have to be there to protect the guys so that they could get out of the tank and so forth. So we tried to do that. Uh, but anyway, the 3rd Armor took off down that hill and they headed right for the bridge, fast as they could. Some of our elements also were there that moved up with the armored division and were got down there. So today when you go to the Rhine River, you'll see a sign there that says the Remagen, that this is where the 104th Infantry Division, the 3rd Armored Division, captured this bridge. Well, we, we were there a couple, couple uh, years ago. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, the bridge was intact. It hadn't gone down yet. And immediately... Now you're coming from the German side? Oh, we're coming from the Holland side. The Holland side. Uh, Holland okay. side. Okay. And immediately, uh, they got some troops across there that afternoon. Mm -hmm. And they said it was a beachhead over on the other side, and then they filtered a lot more foot traffic over. Finally, they dared to take some... T uh, oh, they found there were still charges that... Some charges had exploded, by the way, mm -hmm. and the bridge was weakened. Yeah. But the engineers said it would hold the traffic. So they just, they, they, whatever you did with it, the charges, they dismantled them. Mm -hmm. And so they said that we could get armored staff people across. So a few armored divisions, uh, uh, units went across, our foot soldiers went across and so forth. And I got sick. I was so sick I thought I was dying. I didn't know what was wrong with me. My eyeballs turned yellow. My urine turned yellow, and I thought I, I thought I had been poisoned. I really thought I was bad. So an ambulance took me back to the aid station, and uh, they determined that I had yellow jaundice. Well, I suppose I must have been the first one in the company because later a lot of people got yellow jaundice, but it was the diet we were on at that particular time. So I ended up back at the Paris at, the, at a hospital in Paris, which was a, what happened to be a girl's finishing school. And in my room I had a nice window, and I looked down at the racetrack, the horse racetrack in Paris, so I could watch the horse races. Mm -hmm. They were already underway. Paris hadn't been freed very long, but yeah. <laughs> already the horses were out running. Uh, so I had to stay there for a while. I was given a couple of passes to go to the city of Paris. And then shipped me back. I caught up with my outfit uh, oh, uh, before they got to Weimar, Germany. So they had left Cologne, captured Cologne. They had gotten across the Rhine River on the Remagen Bridgehead. And then the bridge collapsed afterwards. I know. It seemed like about seven days or so uh, afterwards. The, it the did. bridge yeah. collapsed, but by that time they had pontoon bridges across the yeah, Rhine. Right. Beautiful area, that Rhine River. I just think it's marvelous. It is. We went you know, down the Rhine. And, uh, and uh, they went through the Ruhr area, the R-U-H-R, mm -hmm. uh, the valley of, of the Ruhr. And then in Weimar, Germany, Weimar, W-E-I-M-A-R, the Zeiss Icon lens and camera factory is there. It was, big thing and I, I was a kind of a camera nut so I was kind of excited about it. and I have a camera from the factory. I have one of these pull out things that I saw and I took. Uh, the interesting thing about Weimar, it was a tough fight and in here, that thing, you find a lot of story about that fight in Weimar. They weren't about to give up that city. They fought hard for it. There were casualties heavy on both sides. Once the city was in our control, then there, there were three concentration camps not far away from Weimar. 
One of them was Buchenwald. Uh, another infantry division took that and cleared that. We were assigned to get Nordhausen. Nordhausen was a N-O-R-D-H-O-H-A-U-S-E-N, was another one. Primarily Polish prisoners were in it. And then not too far away was another one called Belsen, B-E-L-S-E-N. So that was a, the first time of, that we had contacted that kind of thing. And I was present when we got to Nordhausen and uh, the thing that struck me about the place where the bodies piled, they had outside stairways on these two-story dor dormitory-like buildings, and under a few of them were bodies piled, frozen to death. They had not been cremated yet. They died, you know, they'd worked to death and uh, died, and nobody had taken care of them. They were just there, frozen. And one guy uh, came up to a friend of mine, and he fell on his knees and he thanked God that he was going to get home to Brooklyn again. He was back home visiting his family in Germany when he was conscripted into the German army and he spoke perfect English and he was just so happy he was going to get back to Brooklyn. Oh. He was one of the guards? Well, he uh, was one of the one of the guards there at the place. The person, you know. yeah. Uh, huh. they were, and they were given up, you know, as fast as they could. Yeah. Then from Weimar, had you heard about the concentration camps? I didn't know anything about concentration camps. Until you camps. saw them. As a matter of fact, you ask people in Weimar, Germany, about these concentration camps, they knew nothing, or they pretended they knew nothing about them. Absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. So then our next objective was to head to the east, to the Elbe River. But before we get to that, again, when you're going into how big a town was Weimar? Big city. Big city. So, how do you, um, how does your machine gun squad operate in a city? And that's different than out in the countryside. Mostly, the machine guns at that time were mounted on, on trucks or jeeps. Okay. So we became mobile that way. We had mountings on machine, for every jeep could handle a machine gun. And sometimes we had them on six by six trucks also. And you could move into an area, you could follow tanks in or infantry in and shoot the area up. Well, that's what we did. We, just, we spent a lot of ammunition and scared the hang of a lot of people. And they would surrender by the hundreds. And the civilians, where are they now? Are they hiding in bases? They were or? hiding. In Weimar, they had not evacuated. A lot of those mm -hmm. people in Weimar had come from other towns that had been evacuated. Mm -hmm. But we caught up with them. So anyway, finally the city capitulated and we had Weimar in our control. And then we got out in the country, country from there to the Elbe River. And with half tracks loaded with men, with riflemen and, and tanks, we had a lot of fuel. We had trucks loaded with riflemen. We had trucks with mounted with machine guns. We had jeeps mounted with machine guns. And we just moved. And we were doing 15, 20, 25 miles an hour all day long. Something. Well, it, it wasn't that true. We, we could make maybe 25 miles in a day is a better way of saying it. And uh, you'd pull into a town and all of them, all along the whole front, division after division, was doing the same thing. And we had them on the run. They, used, they, they shot their wad at uh, the bulge. And we just had them on the run. They didn't have ammunition. Their planes weren't flying to give us any trouble. Rarely would you see a plane. Oh, I saw my first jet on that run, and I was intrigued by it. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I guess to say back up earlier on, did you ever have problems much with uh, German planes uh, strafing you? We had some strafing uh, in the Stolberg uh, Eichweiler area. It was an Eichweiler when I was uh, in a second-story building, and it said we had set up some guns in the second-story building. We wanted to fire over the buildings into some fields beyond where the Germans had dug foxholes. And I heard machine gun fire outside of the window, and I was standing right by the window. I turned around, I looked out, and here came a German Messerschmitt flying below the, just first story high, I mean, he was just above the street, coming down that street <coughs> wide open, and behind him was coming a P-47. And the machine gun bullets I was listening to were bouncing off the buildings or the streets around us. 
Well, it just took a second. I mean, all of a sudden, whoosh, there goes the M measurement, and here the next what was the ME 109, I guess they mm -hmm. call it. Yeah. And behind that came this P 47 Thunderbolt. When they hit the end of the street, then I got my head out the window and I watched. That, that Messerschmitt tried to climb, and he wanted to get up high. Well, the distance between that Messerschmitt and this P-47 was like this. I mean, this plane here, I'll climb this guy like you couldn't believe. And within a mile and a half from me, he shot that Messerschmitt down. So that was a time when we all cheered, you know, we got the sucker. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was an Eichweiler. Okay, so you're heading towards the Elbe. Well, we get to the Elbe, and we can't go any further. We stopped. The whole gang, all of us, we, we couldn't probe, we couldn't probe across the river, we couldn't send out scouts, we couldn't do anything. We were ordered to hold our men right there. To wait for the Russians to come? Yep. That was all due to the Yalta conference, yeah. and uh, where Stalin got his way. Yeah, they said, uh, Roosevelt was not on his game. He was kind of, uh, health was failing, well, I think. Well, when you think of it in ret retrospect, though, it wasn't bad for us. We would have suffered a lot more casualties if we'd have gone into Berlin. Mm -hmm. The Russians absorbed those casualties. And it eventually worked out. But we had no fraternization with the Russians at all. They were on one bank of the river, which is about two blocks wide, and we were on the other bank. We had some high-ranking officers from this side go over, and they had high-ranking officers come over to our side to talk, but we were not allowed as uh, mm -hmm. regular GIs to have anything to do with them over there. Mm -hmm. So I never met a Russian. I, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but you could see them. You could see them over there, see their equipment and so forth. Uh, it, uh, and that pretty much was the end of it. Because then in uh, April, it was about April 7th, earlier that, around that time, uh, VE Day occurred. Mm -hmm. And uh, within a week, we were withdrawing and heading back across Germany to France. Because we were going to be assigned to the South Pacific. Our division was selected to go. I think Terry Allen had something to do with it. I think he just said, we'll go. So we were the, one of the first ones to get back over to France, to uh, the area near Cherbourg. And we were, we were the first infantry division to go from the United States directly to France, to the shore of France. We didn't go to England. We were the first infantry division to end up coming back from France to the United States. And we were given 30-day leaves of absence, each of us, ordered to report to Camp San Luis Obispo in California on August the 1st. And we got out there and we trained hard for about a month. And then in September, old Harry Truman decides to drop a couple of big bombs over there and it changed the whole picture. In August, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that made you pretty happy, I would think. I was in San Francisco on leave the weekend that happened. What a time. What a time. I stayed at the Palace Hotel. Yeah. And you came back on a troop ship from uh, Yeah, France. we came back on, I think, maybe even some of those Liberty ships we built in Superior. <laughs> they were slow-moving old tubs. Did you come into New York? Come into New York, loaded on it. We got into, sent over to Camp Kilmer, loaded on trains right away, and we were gone. Mm -hmm. On home. Yeah. I uh, traveled. Uh, uh, the uh, casualties of your um, your outfit, what, how many and what percentage? Well, our division lost uh, about 3,300 men dead in that time. Not excessive. I mean, this was not bad. There were other divisions that probably were hit harder. The first division, for example, were in combat more. Mm -hmm. We had about 180 consecutive days in, of combat time. We really never had a pullback to a rest area. Uh, we had a number of people missing in action, and there's always casualties too that are non-connected uh, to the war, uh, truck accidents and things of that nature, and we always lost a few of those people. Mm -hmm. Or you'd be bivouacked in some place and a tank would run over somebody, you know, those kind of things. Well, I meant uh, 
follow up on you said the Red Wall Express took your trucks and stuff away. When did you finally get? Well, you know, they only took them for about eight or ten days. Oh. Then they came back. That's when we started north. And if you look at the, see, we were in the Canadian Ninth Army, our Canadian First Army first. And when we left Holland, we went into the U.S. Ninth Army under General Simpson. Now, at that time, General Hodges was our, the uh, Corps commander. And he had been the first division, uh, the first Army commander, and he was, became Corps commander. Good man, General Hodges, I think. I would report him as so. Uh, but the first army was the one that took a lot of casualties, a couple of divisions down there in the Bastogne area. Mm -hmm. The airborne division, there was a couple of infantry divisions nearby too that took a licking when they tried to penetrate because they tried to get through and they didn't make it. And then there was winter time and a lot of our casualties were frostbite. We had a lot of people up in Stolberg and Indian that lost their toes because uh, they, they would get pinned down and you'd have to lay there for hours and your feet would freeze. Now you were talking about the little mines that they, did Did you go through areas where they had like the big mines and did you have mine sweep, mine guys go out no, and clear No, we had no what? mine sweepers in front of us. Now I have to tell you one other thing, a young man by the name of Harry Minnick was my jeep driver. Uh, we didn't have a platoon leader. We had lost our platoon leaders. And as a platoon sergeant, I ran the platoon for weeks. That entitled me to use the Jeep. I had a platoon Jeep. Harry Minnick was the driver. And uh, we were going down, I was thinking I was in a pretty safe area, and I wanted to look for a place to set up our machine gun. So Harry and I went on ahead, and we came to a two-lane road, I mean a single-lane road with, you know, tracks down. And I said to Harry, I'm suspicious of this area, but I'm going to walk down there in front. So I'll signal you and let you know what's up, whether you can come or not. And I went down and I studied each track very carefully. I was also looking to see, make sure I wasn't walking into some trap. But I studied each track carefully and I saw no disturbance in the road at all. Not any disturbance whatsoever. So I got down to where I wanted to be and there was a nice ridge overlooking there. We could set up guns and get good fields of fire. I waved to Minnie to come on and he didn't go very far. And all of a sudden the right front wheel hit a mine and I was looking at him and that Jeep went <laughs> and turned right over. Now he didn't die. He was hurt badly. I never forgive myself for that, but because somehow or other I didn't see where that mine was. How would you have seen it? Uh, disturbed dirt. Okay. They can't get the dirt back the way it was. Uh -huh. You know, if you walk on it often enough, or you drive trucks over it often enough, but you're not going to drive anything or walk on it when you supply the mine, so therefore the dirt is going to be a little bit disturbed. Hmm. And that's if why you had, probe. If you had have stepped on it, would it have gone off too, or would it Probably. Take? Okay. Probably. Yeah, they weren't a big, big mine like would blow a tank, but it was yeah. enough to cause a lot of trouble. Yeah. But uh, it wrecked a jeep, and uh, it wrecked some other things that I had confiscated, some beautiful linens from up in in uh, the town of Dern. Mm -hmm. Man, there were some gorgeous. Linens. I was going to take them home. I had them put them on the under the on the windshield under the cover when the windshield was laying down flat mm. and they got smashed and burned up too. Tell me about uh, what it's like to undergo a 88 uh, barrage coming in on you. First time was terrifying. It is just, just, you're helpless. You can't do anything. You feel it covering up your head to be safe and you know that's useless. You huddle down, you hope you've got a decent hole. S fox holes are good because you can stand up and down in them or sit in them. But slit trenches aren't worth much. And my problem with slit trenches is they're, they're supposed to be quick that you can get into. But I'm big. And when I'm digging out a slit trench, all these other guys around me are already inside of their slit trench and I'm still half out, you know, scooping away trying to get down. Uh, but I was lucky. I was lucky so many times. Uh, people around me would get shot like Cook or other people would get hit. Shrapnel would get other people right next to me and I didn't get it. <coughs> Somebody watched over me. 
So. Dumb. Well, we're stationed in San Luis Obispo, beautiful California. And we really thought we were going to go to the South Pacific. So we, for two or three weeks, intensive training and reconditioning took place. Terry Allen's still our commander. And then the bombs dropped on Hiroshima. Mm -hmm. And three days later, the one dropped on Nagasaki. And that stopped things right there. So we had nothing to do. The, the Germans were, I mean, the Germans, the Japanese were trying to arrange a, a, a surrender. Uh, the war had come to a standstill. And I was acting first sergeant of the company because our first sergeant had been discharged. I was a ranking non-com left. Uh, most of our officers had gone. We had some new officers assigned. Uh, the uh, And I had a top-notch company clerk. So every morning, while the men were out doing their calisthenics and their tra training and so forth, I filed the company report with the clerk, and the clerk would get it filed with the regiment, and I went and played golf at Morrow Bay. I played at least three, four times a week, and I get to be a good golfer. I had played golf before, but I, I this was really something. I played good golf. So every morning, uh, then the, after the war ended, after the bombing took place, we had orders to disband the company. And none of the old officers were still around. I was the oldest. You can just pick up for you. Well, you've been playing golf. And yeah, you. What I said before, you don't need. I don't need. I've, I've still I've got it on you. Oh. Anyway, uh, it, it, we got orders to disband the company. The war was over. Uh, I was left to do that job with some officers from the regimental headquarters. So every day I had to make travel orders out for the guys going home because we were shipping them back to their nearest induction center for discharge, centralizing the records and so forth. And uh, every day I had a group that had to go, maybe 25 or 30 guys, and pretty soon we were out of men. So I didn't have a lot to do. So we closed up the company. I wasn't ready to be discharged yet, according to the information from regimental headquarters. They wanted me to stay and do a few other things. So one day I was notified that they were sending me and two other people to San Francisco to greet the returning troops from the South Pacific. They had bands organized there, and when I got there, I was made the guidon bearer. It's the guy up in the right-hand corner who carries the guidon flag that the ranks are guided upon, all the people oh. behind. Mm -hmm. I was tall, slender, <laughs> lean, 185 pounds, yeah. and uh, everybody could see the guidon and they could follow. So I became the guidon bearer. Now, where were we staying? At the Presidio. I wasn't there very long, but it was kind of fun because I was in San Francisco every day on Market Street. Uh, every troop ship that came home, the band was there, and then with a small marching group, about oh, two platoons in strength, would march, and I was the guide on bearer for them. And some officer was in charge of the whole setup and so forth. And then the rest of the time, we had our t free time. So it was a good time. I, I loved San Francisco, still in love with the city today, you know. And I enjoyed taking my wife and family up there and showing them around the place. After, uh, oh, I don't suppose it was lo very long, maybe two weeks, or three weeks, something like that, that came to an end. And it was my turn to go back to my outfit in San Luis Obispo and the regional medical commander who was. Lieutenant Colonel Rouge at the time, whom I still see. He's still a friend of mine. He lives up here in Fremont, California. He's older than I am. I, I contact him every once in a while. Anyway, he said, you're next. So he gave me orders to go to Camp Grant, Illinois, and I went there and I received my discharge from there and I headed for home. 
Now, had you uh, been home since you'd been back to the States, or did you just go straight our, to California? Just had a 30 day leave. Oh, you, you'd have 30 days. Yeah, I had a 30 day leave. So I ended up getting home. I got to tell you this story because it's really fascinating. I called my dad and said, I'm coming home. Now this is right at Thanksgiving time. It was the week end before Thanksgiving. In fact, it was a Friday night. And I said, I'll be, I'm going to come by train from Chicago to Iron River. That's the nearest town that had a train to Port Wing. There's no, no nothing else to Port Wing. I said, meet me there, and hunting season is starting, bring my rifle, <laughs> get me a hunting license and a deer tag, and I'm going to go hunting with you. He was thrilled. Yeah. So he met me at Iron River, and sure enough, he had all my gear. We went over to my hometown of Port Wing, and there my mother was waiting for us at one of her family houses, or with her family, and we all stayed overnight there. The next morning, my dad and I went up to where I had been hunting as a kid a lot, hunting deer. And I'd shot quite a few deer in my young life. Uh, the, the rest of the group that were coming, and what we did was to drive through an area and have watchers on another side, and when the deer came out, we would get a shot at them. So I said to Dad, I'm going to walk down this logging trail. Remember five years ago I spotted a deer down in here? Maybe there's some still hanging around. I don't believe I had walked in there a block and a half. And I saw a set of horns kind of loping along, alongside of me, off to my left front. Got a good shot at it, so I pulled up and I fired, uh, down went the horns. I said, I got them. So I started to walk over there, and suddenly in that same area, I saw a set of horns, and I thought, the sucker got back up. So I fired and I got him. <coughs> I thought I just got the same deer. And my dad yelled at me, what's up? And I said, I just shot a deer. He said, I'll come down. So he came through the brush behind me. I had gone to where I shot the second shot, and there the deer was. And my dad came down, and he came right by where the first deer was. And there he says, you got another one laying here. <laughs> Can you believe, after all those years I'd not been hunting, I walk in the woods, and within 15 minutes, I downed two bucks. So my dad tagged up that one, the first one, and I tagged up the second one. We dressed him up. We drug them out to the road, and now my rest of my hunting party comes. They're finally get here. We got two bucks that morning. <laughs> um, maybe we're jumping ahead a little bit here, but I just wanted to ask you: um, Was it hard for you to adjust to civilian life, and did you have like nightmares and things like that? That uh, problems that some people have. Probably, uh, yeah, I did. Uh, I was home. In November, the end of November, the city of Bayfield, my adopted hometown now, needed some policemen. And Chummy Chapey, a friend of mine, said he would become chief of police. He was just returned from the Navy. And Chummy got a hold of me and said, I need to have you be my deputy. I said, well, for a while I could do that. So he and I became policemen in this town of a couple thousand people. Indian Reservation right out of town. We had trouble with Indians regularly. If they got to drinking, they would be problems. We, our jail in town was worthless, so we had to go to the county seat, which is 12 miles away, Washburn, and that's where we would jail people. Anyway, I served as chief of police, uh, not as chief, but he, I served in the police department there for a while. And, and then uh, I decided that this probably wasn't a good thing to do. And Bev came home one time from her teaching job. She was teaching in Rhinelander. And she said, you know, I'm not going to marry you as long as you're with that police department. I says, really? That's true. Okay. I had asked her to marry me, by the way, and she had turned me down. <laughs> and uh, I didn't really know why. But she finally said that she didn't want me involved in any kind of activity like the police department fighting problems, yeah. community problems. Mm -hmm. So my uncle Thurston was discharged, and he had been in the Italian campaign, and he had come home, and we had gotten together and gone and visited his girlfriend down in Glenwood City. Well, I went to Rhinelander and visited with Beverly. Anyway, Thurston called me and he said, 
I got a chance to buy 40 acres of timber land. Want to go in on it? I said, what are we going to do with it? He said, I want to cut it for pulp and lumber. There's some oak on it, some maple. I said, well, I guess I can quit my police job and go to work. How much money do you need? <laughs> so he said, oh, a thousand bucks. I said, okay, I got a thousand dollars. So uh, we went in, four of us, two, three uncles of mine, Thurston's brother and, and a brother-in-law and myself, the four of us went in. We bought these, this land and we started cutting. We also bought an Oliver tractor, which is a high wheel disc thing to go through the snow. We bought a team of horses. We bought some sleighs. We bought a pickaxe, uh, 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 oh, pickaroons, you know, picking logs so you could pull logs around. Mm -hmm. uh, cant hooks. We bought. We didn't have power saws in those days. Everything was a, a two-man buck saws, you know, or band saws. And uh, we bought all that stuff, and we went out there and started. I built a little shack, or two of us built a little shack for the horses to stay in, because we left them out of the property. We had hay for them and so forth, and we blanketed them every night because it was cold, and they survived fine. Uh, we started cutting timber, and we cut a lot. We, we, the four of us could move through and cut a lot of stuff in a day. And we were good at it. All of us had raised in the forest, so we knew the woods and knew how to cut. Uh, we did that all during the month of January, February, March. End of March, it was getting pretty soft in the woods. The ground was beginning to thaw, and the snow was melting. And the problem then is you bog down in these swampy areas, and so you can't get your loads out. Tractors get stuck and so forth and so on. In the winter time, when it's cold, you had to be careful because sometimes the pressure of the load of logs that you had would compress the snow enough to melt it, and then by the time you got to use it, the, tra the bobs on the sleds were frozen, and the horses couldn't pull it, you know, couldn't move it. So we had all kinds of problems with that, but we solved everything, and we hauled out a lot of stuff. Then trucks came in and picked it up. They picked up the pulpwood and hauled it to the pulp mills. The good lumber that uh, everything was at eight foot lengths. Every, we cut everything eight foot length. And we had trees that were 24 inches on the butt. Uh, you had a, 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 the cutters, the guys who downed the trees. You had some of us played the role of swampers who was going along, cut the branches off. And uh, then we cut them up in pieces and you load them on the sleigh, you drag them out and load them on a sleigh and haul them out to the road. A lot of hard work. But it, we, we liked it. We were having a good time doing this. One day, about a week before we finished the operation, Thurston and I were cutting out a, out a big tree that was probably a big, tall tree. It was probably about uh, two feet on the butt. And the trick of tree falling is to notch one side of the tree and then go to the other side and cut, not into the notch, but just below the notch. And be very careful you don't cut out, because if you do, the tree, when it starts to fall, doesn't fall straight, it twists. So I don't know what I was thinking about. Beverly had, had, had finally agreed to marry me at the end of February. And I, maybe I was thinking about that, thinking about the plans for the wedding and so forth, because I sought out my knots on my side. And as soon as it happened, I realized it and I yelled at Charlie, get out of the way. I called him Charlie, his name was Thurston. He jumped back. The snow was still pretty good, pretty deep. And when he did, he fell down, the snow. And when that tree came down, the big branches hit, the trunk went up in the air maybe higher than this room, and then it rolled over that way and landed right on Thurston over here. Well, it's crazy how this happens. Uh, I guess it's natural because you have a, boat, a bit of hysteria, and I laughed because uh, I didn't, it just came out of me automatically, a laughter. And then he cussed at me, told me to get that thing off his chest. Well, 
how do you get a big butt uh, like that size off of his chest? Thank goodness there was, I checked her, there was snow under him. So I got down on my hands and knees and I scooped with my hands and knees until I got the snow cleared from underneath him and he sagged down so I could slide him out. I got him out of there. But he had a couple of busted ribs, you know, and so forth. So I got him up and it was in great pain. I got him up on his feet and I said, I got to get you on my back. Well, the other two uncles of mine were in another area, but I yelled at them that I was heading for the car with Thurston. He's hurt. So they came and uh, they kind of supported me on the way out. They couldn't help hold him, but I was big and strong and I could carry 180 pounds on my back or so. So I walked out with him and every step I took, it hurt him, you know, and he'd groan and got him into the back of my car. And now, I, where do I go but Ashland, which is 60 miles away. I got to find a doctor. And as I drove down Highway 2, there were a lot of frost heaves. And you hit those things and you'd bounce. Uh -huh. And he was hurting all the way. Got him to the hospital, they patched him up, they uh, had to open up part of him to fit some ribs together, but they did all right. And I had to leave him there, and I had to go home and tell my grandmother, his mother, that Thurston was in the hospital. Well, he only stayed there for maybe four days or something like that. I went and got him, brought him back, because he wasn't any use to us in finishing up our job out there. And when it came time to tally everything up, we tallied it up four ways. Uh, it, uh, well, oh, wait a minute. We didn't, yeah, we tallied it up four ways. And I paid out of mine Thurston's hospital bill because I didn't have insurance. <laughs> so I didn't make much money on that project. Mm -hmm. But Beverly and I got married in June anyway, 1946. 1946. Um, and, uh, what was your first car that you drove? Bought a 1936 Chrysler. That, that's the car you had that you took him in? or That's the car I had. Uh -huh. I bought that when I was working in the shipyard. I oh. left it with my dad oh. when I was in the service. Yeah. That's the car Bev and I had when we were first married. We had children. Yeah, it was a big old boat. but uh, where, did, where did you get married? In the living room of Beverly's house at Bayfield, Wisconsin, overlooking Lake Superior. And uh, so, what did you do after that, after you got married? Then? Well, the next step was to go back to school. Beverly had a teaching credential in Wisconsin. I went back to school and she applied in the city of Superior where I was going to school and she got a job there. And so she became a teacher in that area. We rented an apartment, which was a dump. It's all we could find after the war because all these guys are coming home gobbling up everything. And we stayed there, and uh, our son was born there. And then uh, later, our daughter was born there. We got, we finally got a house. We, after a couple of years, we got a nice house. I what? graduated from college. I got a, a job in Elmwood, Wisconsin. I was the coach of baseball and track and basketball. I taught chemistry, I taught physics, and I taught trigonometry and algebra. How were your teams? I had some good basketball teams. Even today I'm kind of a hero in that town. They had a big reunion recently and, the, and I wanted to come back or back there. I stayed, went and visited a few summers ago. But I uh, couldn't go and so uh, I wrote a letter to them which they read at the... Did you place. go to any coaching clinics? Well, other than no, I didn't go. To, I, I, I other mean, than playing ball at school. I no, didn't. no, no. I mean, I mean, coaches. I mean, did you? Oh, later. Later on. Oh, I, later. I, I was out here when I was coaching. I went to all the clinics. I was no. in John Wooden's clinics every once in a while. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. But uh, then, no, I didn't have. We didn't have any clinics. Okay, you just. Uh, I had some good farm boys. I played good basketball. They were. They were. They did the job. Did you have any set plays or? Oh, lots of set plays. A lot of us. See, when I was playing basketball in high school, you got to remember, everything was set plays because everything went off of a center jump. Every time oh, you scored, right. we had a center that's, jump. That's right. I remember that now. Yeah, you're yeah. right. It was. I remember that. And so, but we didn't have that when I was coaching. We had the ball out of bounds under the end. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, yeah, to this day, these guys are still living, and I, I hear from them and so forth. Yeah. Well, I stayed there for three years, and I had a good record there, and I enjoyed it. It's a farm town. I had a friend of mine living downstairs below me who had been a Navy doctor. He was about my age, and he uh, had a house, an apartment below me. I had the apartment above, and we were together a lot. I even went on calls with him when he would do things. And mm -hmm. He ended up being the vet sometimes in town, too, because somebody would have trouble with a cow giving birth, and Frank and I would go out and <laughs> help the birth. Mm -hmm. To this day, he and I still communicate back and forth. We're, we're good buddies. But then after three years, I had a chance to buy a boat. Sounds strange. But I didn't have the money. This boat, uh, I was going to buy it for uh, $3,500. <clears throat> it's a 38-foot Matthews hull with a Gray Marine engine in it. Sleep nine people. My idea was to take it on Lake Superior trolling, because the trout, lake trout were extensive in the lake at that time. You, I, could, I went out and I guaranteed fish. No fish, no pay. <laughs> out on the limb, I was the only one that did that, but I did all right with it. Uh, Bev and I were married. We were living in Elwood. We had one child at the time. And uh, she was scared to death of us going into this kind of a thing in debt. And I didn't have the money, so I asked a friend, a farmer friend who had just retired, and he was now living in the house below us, or the apartment below, where Frank Springer had lived. Frank had his own house now. By the way, he was the one that had the first television in the town of Elmwood, and we would we, we, we struggled for weeks to get an antenna that would give us the Laker games because the Lakers had just formed in Minneapolis and Johnny Kundla was the coach and so forth. George Mikan played for him and so on. But we never were very successful. These guys are all around. We, we, we laugh about this when we get together. But anyway, uh, back to... Uh, I've lost my train of thought. Back to... Uh, Wait, yeah, that you wanted to get that boat. Oh, the boat. Okay. I talked with this farmer who moved in below me, just retired as a farmer, and he said, Ah, I got a lot of cash. How much do you need? I said, Well, don't you think you need to know something about me first? He said, I know all about you. I've been watching you for the last three years in town. He said, I have no concerns about that. He says, what do you think about the boat? How are you going to make the money off this boat? I explained it to him, and he liked the idea. So I said, if you can loan me this money, I'll pay you $1,000 the first summer. He says, that's no problem. So we went to the bank that's the next morning, and I get a certified check for $3,500 to go buy this boat with. That's Wisconsin people, you know. So Bev and I hustled up to Bayfield, and I got a hold of Red. Red uh, Bates was the guy who owned the boat, and I knew the boat well because I had worked on it in the summertime with Red before, see. And I said, Red, here's your check. Well, you know, he was thrilled because he wanted to buy a bar in town. <laughs> so he had $3,500, I now own the boat, and I had a license to operate it. So I, we named it the, the, the uh, Four Roses, and I had a big Four Roses, beautiful Four Roses, and the transom. It was an eight-foot wide transom, you know, and uh, it, it was a good-looking boat, and uh, everything was in pretty decent shape. The motor was getting kind of worn and kind of old. I had to buy a new motor, by the way, uh, but uh, it was good enough to operate with for a while. So that first summer, Bev and I, she was my first mate. And we had advertised the Four Roses in every bar in northern Wisconsin. <laughs> and people would see these cards and say, Four Roses, you know, or they were drinking Four Roses or whatever. And we had, she took phone calls and we, we booked people. I tell you, we were so busy. And I got $45 a day with that boat. Carried 110 gallons of gasoline. Gasoline was cheap, that's good. And we caught fish. We caught fish all the time. We had to go out 12, 15 to 20 miles sometimes to, to catch fish out in the deep water. If we wanted to get big ones, 
and we caught him up as high as 38 pounds. Mm -hmm. I had a ball. She was great. And then uh, we had the baby we had to worry about. So on decent days, we had a buggy that you could unfasten the springs and it would sit and rock. And we'd put that out of the way on the deck there, and the baby would sleep, and they would take care of the baby and still help take care of the lines of the fishermen, get fish off the hooks, and so forth and so on. She was great. So uh, we uh, survived that first summer. I paid the guy uh, over $1,000. And then we went back to oh, that. Then I went to work at uh, Central High School in Superior, Wisconsin. Got a job up there. I was also coaching, and I was a chemistry physic a chemistry physics teacher. I had sections of both, three of one chemistry and two of physics. Big high school, about three thousand kids, and we rented a house about a block and a half from school, so I could walk to school. Didn't have to worry about transportation. And Beverly, uh, this was 1951. See, I was in Elmwood, 47, 48, 49. 50. Baby, Beverly became pregnant and the baby was born in 51, so our second child was born in Superior, a girl, Sally. Uh, we, uh, we enjoyed Superior. I could still deer hunt, do all those things, duck hunt. And that hunting season, that fall, <clears throat> that the baby was born, uh, I had got a nice buck that day and I brought it home and I decided I would skin it out right away while it was not unfr not frozen. So I dragged it down the steps into the basement and I hung it up down there ready to do some skinning because I always dressed out my own deer and so forth. Uh, I had just got started on the job and Bev was upstairs baking bread. In those days we made our own bread and things, you know. She had a number of loaves of bread in the oven. Uh, she uh, all of a sudden opened the door up above and said, Ralph, you got to help me. We weren't expecting the baby, but she was going to deliver. Mm -hmm. So I forgot about the bitch, bread, shut everything off. I took Bev with me and, and our young son, Michael. I dropped Michael off at Norm Olson's house, who was the head basketball coach, and uh, to take care of. And then I went on with Bev to the hospital. And that was about 7.30 at night. And when we got there, the nurses called for the doctor, but the doctor wasn't available right then. So the nuns delivered the baby <laughs> very quickly. It didn't take long at all. So we had a baby girl. And uh, she became sick a year later. Very sick. And so we were concerned about it. Had doctors look at her and check her. She had a bronchial problem. And that summer, I, w I decided that uh, if, if, if it were possible, I might make a change from the cold climate in northern Wisconsin. I was just thinking about that. And out of the blue, a man comes to me and says, are you willing to sell your boat? Funny how all these things work together. So I said, sure, I think I would sell my boat. The lamprey had come into Lake Superior, and I was catching fish, big fish, that should weigh 18 and 20 pounds, and they were only 8 or 9 pounds. Mm -hmm. And there would be a, a, an eel lamprey attached to the skin. They had big teeth, mm -hmm. and, and uh, like viper teeth. And they'd cling, and they'd suck the blood out of the fish through their body and then bring back in nutrients, uh, nothing that was worthwhile. So I knew the handwriting was on the wall. Lake Superior was infested. And how did they get there? They had attached themselves to the hulls of ocean-going ships that never had come into the lake before until they opened up the Wild Canal. When they opened that canal up around Niagara, then the ocean ships were able to come in all the way to Duluth, and we were infested with lamprey. Mm -hmm. So the handwriting was on the wall. I said to the guy, yeah, I'll sell the boat. Now, I had paid 3500 for it. And I had made quite a bit of money over the last four years. So he said, how much do you want? And I said, 3500 He said, sold. <laughs> he says, meet me at your bank in the morning. So I went up to the bank in the morning. Sure enough, there he was. 
and he has wired in 3500 bucks to my account. So mm -hmm. then he turns and says to me, would you uh, take me to Duluth? Now Duluth is around the horn out there, and it's probably about a 70 mile trip. I says, I would like to, but I can't. I have work to do. I'm a teacher in Superior, and I need to go there. So he said, well, can you help me get part of the way so you can steer me in the right direction? He didn't know much about what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can take you around to Cornucopia. There's a Cornucopia, Wisconsin. It's right on the tip of Wisconsin. I can take you around to Cornucopia. I'll leave you there. I'll give you a compass course to follow, and you can go right into the, to the big gates where the railroad bridge is in Duluth. That was good for him. We got around the cornucopia and a heck of a wind came up, bad wind, high winds, 45, 50 miles an hour. It's a nice sheltered little harbor in there. But he couldn't get away for a few days. In the meantime, I drove back to Superior. I had my wife come pick me up and we drove on mm -hmm. up to Superior. Uh, the, um, he finally called me and said he was going to take off. So he did. He came straight in right where he was supposed to go and did the job. About four years later, I was out here in Palm Springs. I went back one day or went on a trip to see my family, and uh, I had to go over the aerial bridge in Duluth. That's before they had the big bridge they have now, which doesn't open up. Big ships go under it. And so the aerial bridge opened, you know, the bridge came apart and came up, and I got out to look and see what was causing the problem, and here was the Four Roses <laughs> coming through. It has a high radio mask on it, you know. <laughs> So that was it. And I thought, then we got out of the car and we looked at it and had a good time. <laughs> you never have as many friends as you believe you have until you get a boat, a big boat. <laughs> There's an awful lot of people that like to go out on boats. So what got you out here to California? Well, <coughs> our daughter was not well. Yeah. And Bud Heisel, my doctor friend, said, you know, Ralph, if you could find a place for this girl to go, it'd be great on the desert. Hard to believe, but within two days, Dr. Art Hoff from Palm Springs, California is at my door telling me that he superintended schools in Palm Springs and he's a good friend of George Shaw, who was my principal at Central High School, and that <coughs> George was fully aware of my daughter's problems, and he said, would you be interested in coming to the desert of Palm, Palm Springs? I said, I don't know a thing about Palm Springs. I've never been there. In fact, I hardly ever heard of it. So he said, well, you'll like it. He was from Superior. He grew up in Superior. And his father was a janitor at the school my wife was teaching at. Small world. So I said, you know, Dr. Hoff, I'll think about it, but I don't think so. Well. As time went on that summer, in July, more and more we realized that this girl needed some help and why not give it a try. So I have a good friend named, uh, sorry, anyway a friend of mine who teaches with me and he had a nice garage and he said to me, why don't you store all your furniture in my garage? I had room for my car in there, and you could you could have that other garage. Uh, Roy Zidell is the name. Anyway, I thought, well, that's a great offer. So I got a hold of an old two-wheel trailer, and I rebuilt that thing completely. Uh, loaded up all our goods in it that we were going to take, our bedding and our utensils and our clothing and so on. And I bought a 1949 car. I had bought one. I bought it new, so this was 1953, I still had this car. 49 what? 49 Ford. First automatic transmission. Uh, so we put a trailer hitch on that car and uh, loaded up our trailer with all our stuff, left our house that we were renting, and we headed like Okies for California. And when we got further out here west, we bought water bags, you know, so that we were really in tune with everything. <laughs> and uh, came into Palm Springs. Now, the night before that we arrived in Palm Springs, they opened a new horse racetrack in Las Vegas. 
I've never heard of it, but it was a big, big opening. And 10,000 cars were on the two-lane, the only two-lane highways, there was no freeway, on the two-lane highway to Las Vegas from Los Angeles. And just uh, outside of Redlands, a ways up there in the high country, I uh, finally was exhausted. Bev didn't drive a car. So I said, Bev, I can't continue with this. I, my eyes are going out of me. I, on me. I can't keep this up. So I found a place to pull off the road back a ways and couldn't be seen from the road and we all fell asleep. It was hot. In the morning we woke up and uh, we continued on into Redlands and found a place in a gas station where Bev could clean up the kids. Bought some little knickknacks in a store. In fact, it was a Safeway, uh, not, a, not a Safeway, a State of Brothers store. And I was impressed by that store because it had the most magnificent meat counter I'd ever seen. I thought, oh, this is fantastic. So we drove on into Palm Springs. And uh, when we got here, it was 121 degrees. For a nickel, I'd have turned around and gone back. But we stayed. Art Hoff was very gracious. He was on vacation up at Arrowhead, Lake Arrowhead. I called and uh, his phone number, and they routed it through to him up there. And I talked with him, and he says, I'll be right down. So he came down. I had no idea where we were going to stay that night. And he says, I've got my house all set for you. Your house? Yeah, he says, you're going to stay in my house. Well, you know, he had a pool, a nice house over by the hospital, so there we stayed. And we lived there for a week or ten days, and we had a good time there. He finished off his vacation up there at Lake Arrowhead, and then he came down, and we moved out of his house, but in the meantime, we had found a house to rent down on uh, South Cali uh, Rolf. Uh, some good friends of mine lived around that area that I have had good friends for 50, 60 years now. And so, <coughs> we lived there for one year on rental, and it was interesting. We contacted and got a doctor right away, Dr. Stevens, uh, and our girl began to thrive, just like that. Nothing special done, it's just that the drier climate healed her, helped her. And then I began to talk to people around town, a lot of them had come from the Midwest and had the same type of thing happen to them. So we stayed here. And the next year, of course, I was offered another contract, and the year after that, and I, I received a contract when I came here. Were you teaching at the high school? I was at Palm Springs High School, yeah. Mm -hmm. Started in 1953. Uh, I was teaching in, in Elmwood, Wisconsin, and Superior, and I had what I thought were good salaries in Wisconsin. When I came to California here, I got $5,000 a year more. So that was pretty good. And uh, we had a good winter great time. Uh, became involved with my horses again because friends of mine had horses at Los Compadres and I got to know most of them pretty well. I've been a Los Compadres member now for 50 years or whatever. Uh, good good staff, excellent people, small high school. Were you doing some coaching? At the I was a basketball coach. I was hired as basketball coach so I was recruited as the basketball coach, as a physics, chemistry teacher, and a math teacher. I had all those assignments perfect, a nice setup. I had the best kids in the world. I had kids that had high IQs. They came from families that uh, had it. They had money, they had things. I had a few kids that came from the have-nots too, but not many. And these kids that I had by and large all ended up going off to good universities all over the country. I had top-notch classes. I, what a dream, you know? And I was apparently good at it because I became very popular. Classes grew. They had to hire another teacher to do the to take on extra classes that had developed. School began to grow. I had good basketball teams. Won a championship here. Had the highest scoring uh, kid on the team in the state at one year. Who was that? Charlie Jordan. Charlie Ray Jordan, six foot five black kid. Mm -hmm. I had given him a basketball as a freshman. <clears throat> I talked with his parents. I bought the basketball myself. I said, I want this boy to handle a basketball. Every night. Put him to bed with the basketball. 
take wherever he goes, this basketball would be in his hand. He can dribble it, he can spin it, he can toss it in, he can catch it, whatever. One hand, two hand, I want him to get used to a basketball. Well, he got used to a basketball. He was good. So when he graduated from high school here, uh, Gonzaga University offered him a full scholarship. He went up there and played with them for four years. When he graduated from Gonzaga, he had a commission in the U.S. Army, and he went to Europe and he played on the all-European military team over there. He had good, good military duty. When he came back to Palm Springs, I uh, went to bat for him with Frank Bogart and got him a job as uh, uh, with Howard Haddock on the Recreation mm -hmm. Department here in the city. Well, this is the first black they had hired, and old Frank was a little concerned about it all. But he finally came around, and so I credit him with that. Charlie stayed here for a while, but Riverside County saw him, and they said, oh, man, we need this kid, so everybody's looking in the direction of the blacks. When Charlie was in high school and playing basketball for me, we played Blythe, and we played Holbrook, and we played uh, down Calexico, and all those two, up in Riverside High Schools and so forth. And I had never met a prejudiced person in my life, I'm, honestly. In fact, I knew very few black people in my entire life. There were no blacks in my military outfit. There were no blacks in my high school. There were no blacks in our town. But when I got here, I had a lot of kids off of Section 14 that were black kids. And uh, I, uh, I enjoyed them. I really enjoyed them. And they wanted to learn in the worst way, and they gave every bit of effort they possibly could. I can name a lot of good kids that graduated from here that were black kids. Anyway, Charlie made it. What year did he graduate from He graduated from here in 1956. I just saw him a few weeks ago. Did you? Yeah, he got to give me the biggest hug. I thought he was going to hurt me. <laughs> He's playing weight right now, this guy. Yeah, playing weight, I'm telling you. So he calls me his dad. <coughs> he refers to people. That's I'm his son. <laughs> anyway, we communicated by while he was in the military and, and here in town. Uh, he married a girl from Riverside, and they had a boy, who is now back as a in Riverside area as a uh, motivational motivational speaker, very popular man. Charlie took a job uh, in uh, Portland. Well, first of all, he was in Dallas, Texas as a rec city recreational director. From Dallas he moved to Portland. They recruited him up there for city recreation. He liked Portland better. And the next thing you know, he was commissioner of the police department in, in Portland. Mm -hmm. I've been up to see him a few times. He's been down here to see me a few times. I have a lot of former students living in Portland. When I go up there, man, there's a, we have parties. So it's, it's kind of fascinating. Uh, Charlie came down for the 50th class reunion for his class in 1956 a few weeks ago. And it was great to see him. And, and a lot of other people too. We had him down at the, Amer uh, down at the uh, Spa Hotel and it was a really nice setup. I go to a lot of reunions, by the way. <laughs> I know. Uh, tell me about the, uh, the John Wooden camps that you went to, or coaching clinics. Well, I went. To, they were at UCLA. Yeah. I went to a couple of them up there. Did you? Yeah. And I learned things from John Wooden. You can't help but learn from John Wooden. So, uh, yeah, that was important. How long did you teach at the high school? I taught at the high school. I was coach 1953, 54, 55, 56. I ended up in the hospital. Uh, with a brain tumor, old football injury. Diane may remember that. It, it hit the school pretty hard. Uh, you know, a teacher, friend of theirs, and suddenly you're fighting for your life. And uh, in those days, you know, the kids had a nickname for me. <clears throat> the movie Shane had come out, very popular movie, mm -hmm. and Alan Ladd lived here in town. Uh, so I became Shane. Now there's no comparison between Alan Ladd and me. <laughs> Alan Ladd is not very tall. But uh, kids call me Shane. 
So when I went to the reunion here a few weeks ago, the 50th class reunion, <laughs> the first thing when I entered the place was shame, you know, <laughs> 50 years. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, that was Charlie, and uh, some of those kids are still living here in town. They were that are, were leaders in the town. Victor Reyes worked for the water company all no, those years. No, I'm very well. And Victor was my point guard, and it was a good one. I had uh, one or two boys, that got, one boy that got in trouble with the law, and he died in prison. Mm -hmm. And that it's always a disappointment when that happens. Yeah. yeah so. The, uh, you, how how long were you laid up with your? I had to quit coaching. The surgery that was done on me is called a Torkelson operation. It was new. It was before shunts came in. This is a shunt type of an operation. And the, the surgeon, Dr. George Patterson of, of uh, Los Angeles, Good Samaritan Hospital, uh, embedded a tomb in the tumor. He siphoned it off. He grooved it into my skull. It's still here. Down into my spinal cord where the fluid drained. So as the fluid collected in the tumor, it drained off with a siphon. And uh, he predicted I would have trouble with it. He said it's going to give you back trouble, it's going to give you sciatic nerve troubles, and so forth. And he was right. That summer, I couldn't work at all. I couldn't do anything. I was in pain constantly. And Beverly had just learned to drive a car. I had spent time with the teacher how to drive a car. And because I thought, if I'm not going to be able to work, she's got to drive a car. She had a teaching credential, and she taught here in Palm Springs at uh, Cathedral City and Catherine Fitchie School. So one day, Culver Nichols, from whom I bought my house, came by and said, are you planning on going home to visit your family? He and Sally, his wife, she was Sally Ste he, she was uh, Stephen's daughter, uh, who was the owner of the Calverto Hotel. And I said, I'd love to go, but I don't know how I'm going to do it. He says, well, let me advance you some money. So he offered me $2,000 to pay my way to go, to go home to Port Wing and visit my family. I guess he thought I was dying, and I said, well, you know, i got to get there. And he says, well, Beverly can drive you. I said, I don't know whether she can. And so I was brought up to Beverly, and she said, well, she'd try it. And she drove us all the way back. She did a great job. Two-lane highways again, all the way. And when I got there, my dad was operating a power plant on what is called the Bad River in Wisconsin. Uh, it was a pretty fast-flowing river. And I had a pair of tennis shoes, and I had been told to wade in, in the water if I could find it. So I had a pair of tennis shoes and jeans, and every day I walked in that fast-moving water. And in the meantime, I took shots for the pain in my sciatic legs from a doctor that I had known growing up with who lived in Ashland. And uh, they were vit vitamin A complex shots is what they were called. And do you know that after about a month of this treatment of the shots and the walking in the water, suddenly my pains were gone. They just left me, just like that. Yeah. And I never had well, that kind of a pain again. Now, Dr. Patterson had told me, he said, I said, what's the prognosis on my surgery? You know, how long? He said, well, I'll be honest with you. I think that tube I put in there is going to last you about 15 years. And he says, if everything works out right, you know, I don't see a reason why it couldn't be replaced. I've never had it replaced. I can tell when it's wrong because pressure develops in my eyeballs, and they're called eye grounds. And the doctors can immediately look in there and see where the pressure's coming from. So uh, I never had that done, and I'm way past my years from 1956 that mm -hmm. I'm supposed to have had. And all I prayed for was to see my kids grow up. But uh, now, I'm, now my grandchildren are growing up. So did you get back in the classroom then right oh, away? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had, I had the best kids in the world, still do. Some of those classes after I came back, the class of 1957, you know, that's a fabulous class. Those kids went through all of this with me. 
how long did you uh, stay at the high school? Uh, did you I uh, <coughs> left the classroom in 1952 because I was asked to be a six, 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 62. 52, or 62. Right. Because I was asked to be principal, at the, uh, assistant principal at the high school. So I became assistant principal at the high school in charge of the guidance division. Another assistant principal, Way Reynolds, had the attendance division. And uh, there I worked for a few years, and then about 1957? 67. I'm 67, I'm sorry. Uh, Dick Cunison left his job as principal of Nellie Kaufman. Junior high, it was a three year junior high. The board called on me and asked me to come over and take over that school. I think it's somebody else to be assistant principal. So I thought, well, okay, I'd like to try that. And I had good years at Nellie Kaufman. We built a new school out there. I was mm -hmm. while I was principal. Yes. I again <coughs> had an opportunity to select staff pretty well. And I had some great teachers who did a great job and we had good schools. Then, uh, Suddenly, the new superintendent of schools, Ed Larson, died. I was principal of Nellie Kaufman out there in Cathedral City. And <coughs> John Sanborn, a friend of mine, and a few others on the school board called me that morning. Ed died and said, we want you to come in here to the office. So I went into the district office, and that's when they told me Ed had died. and that. They were appointing me as acting superintendent, interim superintendent of schools, it's called. So I became interim superintendent, a job I didn't care for very much. It's too political. Uh, I did do a good thing that I thought during the time I was there. They were right, Ed was right in the middle of contract negotiations, which might have been a factor in his death, I don't know. <clears throat> but he was in the middle of that, and they were kind of stuck. But having been a classroom teacher with many of the teachers, uh, and having been a principal with other teachers that uh, they knew, <coughs> their president and I hammered out a, a uh, decent, uh, what, do I, what would I call it, a decent contract mm -hmm. within a matter of a few days. They went before the Teachers Association, and they bought it, said fine. I went to the board, they bought it, and we solved that whole problem. Uh, so I, 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 I say that was a good thing. Yeah. Uh, I didn't stay in the job very long. I didn't want to stay. I told the board that I would not take the superintendency, that if they wanted to hire, because I was 60 years old. Not quite, 59 I guess. And I said that I don't really want to, to stay on too long. I want to retire. I've got other things I want to do, <clears throat> one of which was to travel. My kids are grown. And so uh, they said, well, would you serve as a uh, co-principal with someone? I said, sure. I would be glad to do that. So I we became an associate principal at Palm Springs High School, and Ed, not uh, and the young man that re replaced me out at Nellie Kaufman. Oh, I feel terrible about this, and I can't quite bring up his name right now. But he was a good man, and uh, I stayed on there with him for a year. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, I stayed on with him for a year, and then I left and went over to Raymond Cree as principal over there. Uh, then when I retired in 82, Bob Andrade can tell you all about his shenanigans in this thing, because he and Ralph Coomer and my wife put together all of this retirement stuff or my history of my life, and they had a big to-do about it, and it came out into the school newspaper, and it hit the desert sun, and I didn't know anything about any of this. And then when I went to a graduation ceremony in 1982, at the commencement exercises on the football field, 
the Board of Education chairman, president, gets up and he dedicates the field to Ralph Watt and hands me a, a uh, what do you call them anymore? It's a parchment. Uh, yeah, like a certificate or something. Yeah, well, it's, whatever. Oh, a proclamation. Proclamation, yeah. that's what the proclamation. <laughs> yeah. Dedicating that in my name. So that's how that all came about. And that's I was great. floored. Oh. I was embarrassed. I, I thought there's so many good people that should have deserved it. They've been here longer than I have. They've done a, as good a job as I have. So I didn't know what to say for a long time. But now, when people talk to me about it, I say I'm proud of it. Well, if my wife is any judge, she's you were always her favorite teacher, and and I think she speaks for you know, uh, I was just in love with a lot of those kids. They were great. <laughs> I still call them kids, even though they're. In your job as a principal, that's somewhat of a management position, I mean, type of a thing. Yes, it you is. Have to, do you think that being a platoon sergeant where you had guys under you and you had to get things to work right, that helped oh, you? Oh, I'm sure that? that helped. You know, you're related to personnel. Yeah, I'm sure so. that's true. <coughs> and so you've done a lot of traveling in your retirement? I understand. We did for a long time. We motorhomed all over the place. Oh, We've okay. taken some cruises and so forth. Yeah. I'm not a great cruise fan. I'd rather go to a place and stay. Mm -hmm. um, now, did you live in the in the same, you, did you buy a house from, you said from, who was it? Uh, I bought a house from Culver Nichols. Right, and where was that? I paid him off his money, by the way. Oh. <laughs> and I bought a house over here, one of them he built in 1947, and he had rented it for a short time to another man and his wife. Mm -hmm. And we bought it. We were really the first people to live in it. Out of Bourbon. And I still live in that house today. And where is it? What's the address? Over on 1134 North Cali Rolf. That's in the Canyon Country Club area? No, no, not, no. not that far. It's over uh, toward the hospital. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Over by uh, Ruth Hardy Park? Kind yeah. Of in that it's area. not quite as far as Ruth Hardy Park, but it's between Sunrise there and Ruth Hardy Park. And your children, what were their names again? Michael Lowell is currently a building contractor in Yucca Valley. Mm -hmm. He started as an electrical contractor and now he's a general contractor. He uh, does a lot of home repairs, he does a lot of home additions, and he does a few brand new homes. Does he have children? He has uh, one stepchild. Mm -hmm. uh, he married a girl who had a child. And what's her, what, well, what's, what's his wife's name? His wife's name is Vicki. Mm -hmm. And the boy is Graham. Okay. And he works for Mike, by the way. Oh, he does. Oh, okay. He told me the other day, he's, that's his life's work. He's going to do exactly what Ray, Mike is doing because he says, I learn a lot from him. So. Mm -hmm. And your daughter? Our daughter is Sally, who teaches yet at Catherine Fitchy School, second grade. She's married to John Sanji, a former policeman from the Palm Springs PD, who was badly hurt with another officer in an arrest a few years ago. And uh, he, as a result, he had to have surgery that removed all of this damaged side in here, including ribs, so he's held mm. together with a mesh screen. Mm. And he's on disability uh, retirement. And uh, he's been working in surveillance at the casino Mm. That's different from security. Oh, just watching. Surveillance. He yeah. catches people. Mm -hmm. uh, he went to training for the state of California, and uh, so he really is kind of like a state employee. And do they have children? They have two children. The oldest is a girl by the name of Kaylee, who's uh, going to COD right now. And the other girl is Chelsea, who's attending Cal Baptist She's an outstanding swimmer, and she hopes to get into uh, sports medicine. And uh, you and Beverly, do you still go to church a lot? We go to church every Sunday. Yeah, where Where do you go? There's a chapel. Mm -hmm. Fred Donaldson's pastor over there. Uh -huh. um, we belong to a lot of organizations in town, too. I was president of a number of them for a long time, but I've backed off. I, I can't keep up. I don't have the energy to do these things anymore.
I'm surprised I have the energy to talk as long as I have today. <laughs> well, you did. Yeah, it was great. What, okay, well, let's let's uh, wrap this up here pretty quickly. Um, one thing, if you, um, uh, what would you say to uh, a young person that uh, is either in the military or will might be going in and maybe going in harm's way before long? What kind of advice would you give them? Well. I think you have to get a mindset to believe, to believe in whatever supreme being you want to believe in. I think you also need to think that you don't anticipate serious things happening to you. I prayed all the time that I didn't lose a limb. If they killed me, okay, I can understand that. But I don't want to lose, I don't want to be handicapped. Uh, secondly, conditioning is important. It's the guys who couldn't keep up a lot of times who became casualties. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily from warfare, but casualties from other things that might have befallen them. Uh, conditioning is very important and become skilled in your craft. Know what you're doing. And I, I think that once you get a taste of these things and recognize your limits and how you can handle them, you can do it. I watched so many young men do that. Give them a few days in combat or firefights, and they begin to know what to do, how to protect themselves, how not to expose themselves, when to do it, and when not to do it, and all that kind of things. So uh, preparation is important, but you gotta you gotta think too. You gotta think. You can't just blindly. I remember one kid one night got so frightened with the barrage of 88s coming in on us. And we always cautioned him, don't get up. He jumped out of his foxhole and thought he could run away from this. He didn't run very far. Pretty soon he was torn apart. You know, and, and, I, and I just, uh, you, you, of course, he couldn't handle it. That's, that's the problem. He just couldn't, uh, psychologically he couldn't handle it. He shouldn't have been there, but he was there. Ralph? Thank you so much for your service to our country. Thank, Thank you. you. And your service to Palm Springs Thank and you. for coming in and sharing with us. Thanks a lot, Dave. Okay. Appreciate it. Very good.